Einen schönen guten Tag und herzlich, äh, sorry, wrong language. <lacht> yes, we can understand you, yes. So, welcome and a good afternoon in Germany. A very good morning to our participants from Latin America and the Caribbean to our third and final day of our virtual conference from our Expo Virtual Green Tech for Latin America. Um, well, just as in the recent days, my name is Ferdinand. I am consultant from the company Energiewächter. We are organizing this event together with our waste network of partners from Germany and from Latin America. Um, I will just show you the program of our today's session. So um, our session for now will focus on the topic of green transition in the energy infrastructure. And um, right now we will have soon a presentation on um, financing opportunities for uh, power transmission systems. And uh, we will have an expert talking on energy storage policies and market uh, trends here in Germany. And afterwards, we will have further presentations from German company providers with their efficient and sustainable technologies. Um, in our second session, which is uh, about to begin in roughly two hours, um, the focus will be on green tech solutions for smart cities. And um, we will have the presentation of the first plus energy building in Latin America, which is located in uh, Mexico in Puebla, um, represented by uh, two German architects. Uh, architects. And um, afterwards, we'll have a, another um, expert from the uh, Banco de Desarrollo, the America Latina, speaking about e-mobility in the public transport sector in Latin America. And um, in conclusion to that, we will also have another presentation from a German company which offers such charging infrastructure for e-mobility and for the use in electric cars. Yeah. Here again, just to thank all of our partners and supporters, the German Chambers of uh, Commerce and Industry in Latin America and in the Caribbean, as well as uh, quite a bunch of different um, associations from Germany and also from Latin America, like the FICAICA, the Federación de Cámaras y Asociaciones Industriales. So um, we are really here with support. And thank you again to all of our partners and supporters, and of course, our premium sponsors and exhibitors of our trade fair. Well, so let's get started. Let's just dive into our program. I want to introduce you to Mr. Daniel Plankermann. He is the energy sector coordinator of the KFW Development Bank. Hello, Daniel. Uh, hello, good afternoon, good morning. I hope you can uh, hear me well. Yeah, perfectly, perfect. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah, as, as I already mentioned, uh, Daniel will speak about uh, the financing of sustainable power transmission systems and especially, of course, what the KFW Development Bank um, is offering in this sector. So Daniel, please go ahead and share your um, presentation. Okay, so let me see whether that works. Can you see the presentation? We can see it, but uh, not yet in full screen. Okay. Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. Please. Yeah, no, Stage sorry for that. Yes. <laughs> no Thank problem. you very much. <laughs> no, thanks, first of all, for, for inviting me um, and giving the opportunity to present um, what KFW does in, in Latin America, especially in the in the area of energy and, and power transmission, and in particular sustainable power transmission systems. So I dive right in. So um, you might know KFW, but let me give you a, first a very short background of the different areas of, of, of work that we have. So as you know, KFW is the German Development Bank, 
uh, and we have both a national domestic financing arm and we have an international financing arm. So in Germany, which is by far the biggest um, chunk of our activities, we work together with the SME sector, we work together with private enterprises, but we also work together with individuals. So we help to finance, for example, energy efficiency loans, uh, but also such things as education loans for, for students. And we also work with municipal entities within Germany. And also, um, it is not in the slide, but recently, of course, we have had a very active role also in supporting German business in um, during the Corona crisis. Yeah. Uh, internationally, we have different areas. So the one that you might know is KFW IPEX Bank on, on the very right hand. That is the export and project financing branch. So that is the, the, the branch of KFW that works mostly with German or European companies interested in financing projects outside of Germany in developing countries or emerging markets. And then we have the development bank, which is the, the bank I represent right now. We mostly work with uh, public sector clients and we are part of the official development assistance pro provided by the German federal government. We, in Latin America, we have quite a large presence, just to give you the, the, the overview. Um, these are also the countries we work in mostly. So um, Brazil, Mexico, uh, partly Central America, but also countries such as Ecuador, uh, Peru, uh, Colombia are very big markets for us. And we do have a presence in those countries, sometimes full-fledged offices, and sometimes we have small representative offices, such as in, in Quito, for example. Just a very brief overview of the, the financial, sorry, the financial instruments that we have in, in the Dialogue Bank. So uh, normally we, uh, we work with German government funds, so these are budget funds, but we are able to blend them with market funds. So as you know, KFW has a triple A rating, so we can easily refinance ourselves. So we can offer all kinds of different financing from promotional loans, which are not so concessional, so they're more market oriented up to development loans, which is a mix of market loans and government funds, and also grants uh, in exceptional countries uh, with funding from the German government. So these are obviously free, so they are not repaid. And just uh, as, a, as a kind of to, to give an idea of, of, of the magnitude of our activities, we provide up to one third of our German official development assistance. Now, focusing a little more on energy, um, I decided not to give you the, the financial figures, but rather focus on impacts. Um, so we work in 17 or 15 countries. We have 17 partners. So we also work with in, intra-governmental organizations, such as um, CAF, the Latin American Development Bank, or the Central American Development Bank. And only in the energy sector, we have 86 uh, sub-projects or projects. And uh, we have quite an impact. We did an exercise um, recently where we looked at the impact we had over the last 10 years in the region. So we contributed to uh, energy generation by renewables, about almost 4,000 gigawatt hours. Um, and um, we helped save almost 1.4 million tons of CO2. That's annual. Obviously, this is, this is only an estimation, but it gives you an, kind of an idea of, of the impact our projects have in, in the region. Now coming more to uh, transmission distribution infrastructure, and um, rather than looking at what we do now, I would like to give you a little idea of where we are heading in, in the region. Uh, you may know, or you may have come across already the uh, EU taxonomy for sustainable finance. So this is a taxonomy that has been elaborated in the last two years to basically help um, financial market participants define what is a sustainable finance instrument or a sustainable company. Um, it is not fully implemented yet. So this is kind of legal or normative work in progress, but the technical criteria to decide what is green, let's say, or not in transmission and distribution infrastructure has been decided already. And we now start slowly um, to also use these criteria to, um, to define or to decide which are the, 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 the areas of transmission distribution infrastructure to work in. Um, 
you may remember that we focus mostly on public lines. So obviously transmission distribution is a very big market for us. And you all know who work in the energy field that transmission distribution is a very crucial element of the transition to a more green um, or carbon neutral uh, energy system. So there's a lot of demand, there's a lot of growth, and there's a very important role for us to play also as a development bank helping the, 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 the transition to a carbon neutral future. So let me dive in a little. It may now look a little technical, but uh, I hope I don't bore you with that. Um, so what, what defines a sustainable transmission system? The EU taxonomy says, okay, we look at a system, systemic approach. So we check or we ask our market participants to check whether the system itself, so the whole generation mix itself is sustainable. We don't look at single power lines. We look at the system. And there are two factors. One is a grid emission factor of less than, you see that here, 100 gram of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hours, or that 60 less than, uh, sorry, more than 67% of new generation capacity is less than the threshold of 100 grams of CO2 equivalent, which is basically the threshold for renewable energy. So how does a system qualify for this? Obviously, either it's already very green, so it meets the first factor, or it becomes greener and greener, because what has been added in the last five years is mostly renewable energy. Um, there's a second criterion. Also, uh, investments might qualify that have very specific um, links to renewable energy. So these are um, equipment on connections of renewable energy directly, or equipment that helps to make the system, the grid, more, more smart, more able to integrate uh, volatile or fluctuating renewable energy generation, basically. Also, what should not happen is there should be no direct connection of a power plant. Um, we, we did an exercise of which countries or systems might meet that criterion. This is a very, since this is new, that's a, still a early exercise and, and subject to change, but the data looks good. So you see the countries that do meet this criteria or the systems that do meet this criteria. So Paraguay, Uruguay, Brazil, Ecuador, and Chile, those that have a more green, let's say, uh, energy mix already. And there are some that do not meet. So um, specifically, this is Argentina, Mexico, and Peru. Because they have a less renewable uh, power mix, and also because some of them have added uh, more um, uh, carbon power to, to a large extent, yeah, looking, for example, at Argentina. So this just as a snapshot. It's not, it's not compulsory yet for all financing, but it's something that we expect will dominate the, dis the discussion of what constitutes a sustainable power tr transmission system in, in the future. Let me now jump to one uh, project example. Um, so you see that we also try to, to apply these criteria in practice and that we do offer um, a, a large financing envelope. So this is a project that has been signed um, just over one year ago. Um, here we work very closely with uh, CAF, uh, Development Bank of Latin America. I, I see that also one CAF colleague will present uh, today. Um, so you see that we are really aligned in, 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 in helping um, support uh, transition to a more green economy in, in, in the region. So in this case, we provide a refinancing line to, to CAF of up to $185 million. It's a concessional loan. And we hope to contribute to higher energy efficiency and a better integration of renewables and power transmission and distribution systems. So in this case, um, the end borrower or the beneficiaries, as you may, uh, are public utilities. It could be private, but I think it's more focused to, to public um, power utilities. Um, who meet these criteria and who have the, the objective themselves to, of, of investing in a more sustainable system. So um, these utilities may apply to CAF or have done so already. So CAF proposes us the, the, the sub-projects and then we work closely with CAF uh, and the end borrowers to make these, these projects happen. Um, we are in discussion about um, financing some already, um, but uh, there is still room for, for, for more financing. 
So we're very happy to work uh, with CAF uh, and, and other interested parties in um, getting a bigger market and demand for this. And we really think we uh, have a big contribution to, to helping uh, the region or the countries in the region uh, to meet the growing power demand, at the same time also meeting their commitments towards a green and more sustainable financing. I will close here. Um, if, if there are questions that, that I can answer, I will be very happy. So um, I think we have up to maybe four, five minutes, so I'm, I'm very happy uh, to answer anything. Uh, also, if you have further questions, please feel free to, uh, to, to contact me directly. Um, but first of all, thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for your input. Um, that's really quite an interesting topic. So. Um, actually, I have some, some questions um, regarding your, your presentation. Um, in, in one of your first slides, you, you showed that um, a, around 4,000 gigawatt hours per year um, comes through projects by, by KFW. Is that correct? It is not only our projects, um, mm -hmm. because we sometimes finance only part of a project. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as I as I mentioned, we also work with partners where we only sure. provide a refinancing. So sometimes mm -hmm. what happens is we um, we refinance part of a loan that itself finances part of an investment. Mm -hmm. So if you, I'm not trying to boast, but I'm just trying to say we, um, if you really looked at the things that are more be directly attributable to our financing, it, it may be less. Yeah, but we didn't go in that exercise because yeah, sure. it's not complicated to, to account for yeah. double accounting and so on. Yeah, yeah. Don't, no, but but again about this number, how, how can we understand this number? Because as, as I understood from your presentation right now, you or, or ex exactly in this part of the work of the KFW um, or, or in international project financing, you won't finance a, a PV park or, or a wind park. Mm -hmm. You just finance the, the power transmission connection for, for this park, for example. Uh, no, in the, in the past, it was different. Mm -hmm. um, also now we would finance um, renewable energy projects. Oh, okay. The thing is, since we focus mostly on, on public clients, the demand has decreased a lot mm -hmm. so in the last 10 years you could see a development where we had a lot of um, uh, renewable energy projects so solar plants wind plants hydropower to a lesser extent uh, that we either finance directly or through some of our partners uh, local or, or international development banks but the demand has decreased so we see really a shift to um, transmission systems yeah, which is still a more public um, field of investment um, or other, let's say, green bonds and this kind of things, yeah, which are more on a systemic level. But we see this shift, which is due mostly to the, the um, competitive, competitiveness mm -hmm. of renewable energy, right? Mm -hmm. which is a good thing. So other people yeah. can finance it. Yeah. So, so it means, yeah, like traditional renewable uh, energy projects uh, on sites, uh, they are already, let's say, attractive investment projects just for, for the private equity sector. And, and you will just um, take care for, for the connection. And as you said, this is more on a systemic level for the transmission grid operators and depends on the country where it's coming from, if it's a governmental institution or, or a more or less private company or maybe a state-hold company, for example. Correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And um, another question, I mean, it's very tough to say because you, you said you have got this um, $185 million, uh, which you are giving as a sub-loan to, to CAF, if I understood it correctly. And, and they would be able to, to well, finance projects in, in Latin America, though. Um, have you got any number about the average or, or typical project size which would be financed? That depends mostly on CAF because they're the ones um, in, the, in the market, um, mm -hmm. but also like us, they really finance on, on larger ticket sizes. So we're talking a minimum of 30 to 40 million dollars, but going up to 250 million dollars. All right, so yeah. Talking about the sub -tone. So, and then we would finance part of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But those are already yeah, bigger projects like Correct. this. This could already yeah. be the 
I don't, I, I'm not an expert, but how, how, how could I imagine this like $30 million for a transmission grid, you could cover probably wide parts of a country with that already or, or depending on the technologies? It, yeah, no, I mean, it, it really depends. Um, mostly these projects are rather programs, so they cover different components going from mm -hmm. very high voltage um, infrastructure. So very often it's upgrades or also new transmission lines, uh, upgrades and extensions of substations, power substations. So if it's high voltage infrastructure, that is quite costly, obviously. Um, often they have components also um, in, in the area of transmission or lower voltage transmission distribution. So for this, you can really cover um, whole regions Yeah, sometimes with, with projects like 50, 60 million dollars. Correct. Right. Okay, great. So thank you very much for now, Daniel. And um, as you said, your, your, you will share your contact data and we would also be happy to share your presentation with our participants as well. Um, we have also got a lot of uh, participants registered and we will just resend them the, um, the presentation if that's fine for you as well. Sure. And um, yeah, so thank you very much for now, Daniel. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. And um, well, ladies and gentlemen, according to our program, our next speaker would be um, the German Energy Storage uh, Systems Association. Um, unfortunately, he's, he, he did not co uh, connect yet. So um, if that's okay for you guys, I would just uh, like to ask uh, Dr. Mike Ifland from the company Highwald to already give your presentation now and we would come back to the, the energy storage topic later on. I see that Mr. Eklund is already switching his uh, microphone on. <laughs> Mr. Hello, Elsesson, Mike. nice to meet you. Hello. Hi. Nice to meet you now virtually after we've uh, phoned quite, a, quite some times before. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a pity because I thought we would have first the presentation on, on energy storage systems. And they also have a big focus on transmission, how to, how to um, bring the... The, the big amounts of renewable energies that we have in the north of Germany, in the offshore regions. Uh, in general, the north of Germany is, is the place for, for wind energy in Germany. And the south of Germany is the place for the industry, more or less. So all the big car manufacturers, for example, are located in the south. So yeah, and, and your company, well, you will go into detail, of course, but you're offering test equipment and in your in your presentation you will specifically talk about the offshore testing so for exactly. the connection of, of offshore wind parks yeah true yes sir yeah so so please share your presentation i think this will really be of interest and we'll see that we get get the energy storage part afterwards <laughs> okay okay let me see if i can if I can make that uh, happen over here, let me share the the screen, and you should now be able to see my screen. Yes, just try the full screen, and this would be perfect. Um, 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 um. Not yet. Here we go. Yes, perfect. Yeah, wonderful. So, Thank you so much, go ahead. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, today, I would like to talk a little bit about offshore testing of wind farm array cables. Uh, for that, I would, I would need to introduce ourselves a little bit <clears throat> on what, uh, what we do, who we are. Uh, I would like to give a short theoretical background of the topic itself <clears throat> on uh, resonant testing. And maybe we have time for some, for some questions, uh, Mr. Elsa, so from your side, and also uh, afterwards, if there's anything that is of specific interest. Who are we? Uh, we are a company that uh, started as uh, Koch and Sterzel in 1904. And back then we were already involved in high voltage equipment, such as voltage transformers, as you can see right here, uh, a transformer cascade, X-raying equipment and, and stuff like that. Uh, during the German Democratic Republic, we were known as TUR. Transformatoren und Röntgenwerke. And uh, after the war came down, we uh, were a part of the Siemens uh, of the Siemens Corporation for for five years or so until we stood on our own feet. 
uh, and became a member of the Rheinhausen Group in 2002. And ever since, ever since, uh, well, let's say during all of this time, we were manufacturing high voltage equipment, high voltage test equipment. Um, like you can see resonance systems over here, transformer test systems, impulse voltage generators. We are still doing that. Um, that same thing, of course, the technology has evolved, but we are still in this kind of uh, business. Um, general information about offshore cables itself, offshore systems. Um, there are basically two cables to be to be considered, or uh, well, let's say two, two cable forms, the, the array cable, which you can see over here, and the uh, it, it, it will collect the energy from all the single windmills and uh, transmit it to the collector station over here. And then the collector station will transform the energy, the electrical energy uh, into HVAC or DC, and then send it to the shore, to the substation on shore via HVAC or DC, depending on the, the technology. To test this export cable and make sure that it's uh, in a good condition is rather easy. Um, you can just set a mobile resonant test system to the uh, substation over here and connect it and connect these systems in parallel or in series, depending on the uh, voltage and power that is required for this kind of cable. And then just uh, test it like a normal underground cable. However, uh, if these array cables are to be tested, the situation is a little bit difficult, a little bit more challenging because now the system has to fulfill offshore conditions. Um, it will have to be uh, set up on the collector station. Uh, it will test, well, these inter-array cables, which are medium voltage. And we are specifically focusing on the after installation test. And um, well, in reality, the collector station would probably look like this over here. What is not supposed to happen is a failure um, in these kinds of cables, because especially offshore, uh, it's hard to find it's hard to find the um, the failure in a cable that is lying underwater, uh, even even today. So uh, by looking at, at the failures and by analyzing them, it becomes clear that uh, it's not so much a matter of where the failure is happening. It could be in the cable, it could be in the joint, or it could be in the termination that is uh, rather equally distributed. And it's also, it's also um, most of the time happening in XLPE cables, which, um, which is of course due to the fact that uh, they are the ones which are mostly installed. Um, but what is interesting is the cause of the failure, so to say, because this is uh, the installation. And um, you can see that when we're looking at the problems that uh, happen during installation, the after installation test, according to standard, um, becomes rather important. Now, when I say, when I say according to standard, you have to know that uh, this is pretty much our daily business. This is our daily um, basis on what we work uh, on. And I would like to form a little bit of a basic understanding on standards um, for technical, for technical uh, things, so to say, or for, for technical devices. The standard is a minimum consensus between the involved companies, so to say. And in our case, and in case of a, a cable, for instance, these are the universities, the cable manufacturers, the test equipment manufacturers, and the users. The standard forms, as an agreement of all of these uh, companies, forms a quality level, which is uh, a legal, which which offers the legal security between the buyer and the seller of this uh, kind of equipment. And the standard um, usually comprises the whole life cycle of the equipment. From, from the design stage, pre-qualification and type testing, to the manufacturing stage after, um, after manufacturing the, the, the routine test and after installation, maintenance sometimes also. <clears throat> now, in our case, when we're talking about the submarine power cables, the IEC uh, 63026 is the 
the standard that is uh, relevant in our case. Um, it allows three different method methods of testing. Um, the resonant testing between 10 and 500 Hertz below 36 kV for 15 minutes and above 36 kV rated voltage for one hour. Very low frequency testing at, um, at 0.1 Hertz for cables uh, below 60, uh, 36 kV and the 24 hour soak test. We'll, although we have to say that um, the soak test is basically just uh, switching on the system and uh, looking for 24 hours, whether it's uh, gonna hold the voltage or not. This is, um, it doesn't have to do anything with partial discharge measurement or, or doesn't look for any kinds of um, failures that could evolve over time. Now, um, the voltage, the rated voltage of the inter-array cables has a little bit evolved from 36 kV in the past up to 66, 69 kV uh, during these days. Why has that been the case? Because the uh, power that is generated from the wind farms has increased, increased dramatically. Um, and with the increase of the voltage of the inter-array cables, um, it is supposed to, well, let's say, it, um, the, the demand behind it is the, to, to minimize the losses, obviously. So uh, we are designing our test equipment for these 72 kVs over here. Um, basic, uh, basic understanding of a resonant circuit, or let's say of a resonant test system, we are forming a resonance, a, a series resonance between the test object in our case, cable or large capacitor, and the resonant reactor. Both are fixed uh, and we still need to match the reactances. So we are adjusting the frequency because we're not, we're not wanting to, to have any kinds of moving parts in mobile equipment. That is uh, always a, a weak point for any damages of the, of, the, uh, of the equipment. We don't want any moving parts. We are uh, adjusting the the frequency. The requirement for an offshore system, uh, it needs to master all conditions such as all different kinds of weathers. weather. It's, it's gonna be icy, it's gonna be snowy, it's gonna be you know, uh, wet also, but it also needs to, um, needs to have a minimum space and weight requirements. Space, because obviously the space of a, on a on an, uh, collector station is very, very limited. And weight, because the crane over here, in our case, it was not able to carry more than 3.7 tons. And for us, that's, uh, that's quite of a challenge, quite a bit of a challenge, actually. The, the equipment needs to be offshore certified and it needs to avoid ecological risks because uh, if it gets damaged, uh, it may not contain, or let's say it may not um, poison the water underneath. That's, that's also important for us. And of course, if we're taking a look at the, at the uh, station or, or the, or the um, offshore um, station itself, it will probably be set on top of this right here, but the cables, the devices under test are coming from right here. So we need to cover this distance over here also. Our solution looks like this. And uh, starting from the control system, which uh, the operator is uh, controlling the, the system with, obviously, the control system itself is linked to the power unit, the IGBT power unit over here. In the, in the power frame. Power frame contains also the exciter transformer and the exciter transformer is connected to the resonant reactor. And several of these units are being connected by this collection point over here. And then the connection is made to the filters, which are really, really close to the, um, to the cables under test, so to say, which are connected right here. We have realized this kind of test system uh, with two reactors in the first stage. And our solution is special because we do not have any open live parts. There is no danger 
of uh, for the for the personnel to touch uh, high voltage up to the connection of the cable uh, of the of the cable under test. The system is suitable for salty atmospheres. It can uh, due to its coating, it's not gonna it's not gonna rust. The the cables itself are will withstand the salty atmospheres also. Um, it will it will work in an offshore condition. The equipment is modular and stackable, so it needs minimum space and weight requirements. Um, it is certified as per DNVGD. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and uh, the oil insulated equipment, as such as uh, the the reactor and the excited transformer, are filled with Mydel. Uh, 7131, which is biodegradable and uh, fire safe. As you can see right here, uh, we have the the resonant uh, the resonant reactor together with the collection point. Um, and the the pictures that you can see right here are from the factory test are taken during the the factory accept test. And we have also commissioned the system and tested it on site. And our experiences are as follows. The, the, the first operation took place at a wind farm near the English coast. And in this particular case, there were eight megawatt uh, wind turbines, 165 of them, I think, uh, roughly 20 strings. And the conditions were as expected. They were icy, they were snowy, they were not as nice as, as when the equipment left the port, so to say. Um, storm with six meter waves, but still, it looked uh, quite impressive on on the main deck, so to say, over here. Um, the connection was made to the filters, as you can see right here, um, and these these filters are not on the on the on the main deck anymore, but uh, deep inside inside the. Um, the test, or let's say the, the, the collector station near the cables on the test. And uh, the connection to the, to the um, cables on the test is being made with a connection cable over here and a Fistera plug at the, at the start of the, of the uh, array cable, so to say. From our experience, the only weather to be avoided is extreme humidity, and that mean, means fog. And also the spraying from the waves uh, is a little bit of a danger for the for the 72 kV over here. This is this is the only part uh, where there is live voltage, uh, the, the connection part, so to say. Um, we were rather thankful for the for the wooden plate that uh, the owners of the of the platform gave us, because what you can see right here, the the, the grid, the mesh. You can look through it and directly see the waves, and that was, of course, also for our equipment a little bit, uh, well, of a challenge. We needed to clean the filters uh, every once in a while with with ethanol, um, and we have to say, finally, the acquisition has proved itself already because during the commissioning phase, we did find a cable that was not installed uh, according to standard. It, uh, well, in our case, it blew up. And we were glad that uh, it happened during the testing phase and not during the operation phase. So much from my side. Mr. Elsesser, are there any questions? Um, yes, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Islam. Um, so to, to, to get this clear, we, we mm -hmm. have seen your stations. They are like, let's say, they are like boxes. Do you move? Do you move the whole cable through it to test it, or do you just connect it to the cable and then test the whole cable to the connection point, which would be probably, let's say, the the uh, wind energy, the offshore wind energy plant? Um, let me switch a little bit back and forth between mm -hmm. the slides. Mm -hmm. Please. Um, you can see the the storage and the feeding container mm -hmm. over here. Uh, these are located on the main deck, mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. Um, the resonant reactors are positioned anywhere a little bit uh, closer to the um, closer to the uh, cable deck over here, mm -hmm. somewhere where we can still someplace where we can still reach 
um, some place which we can still reach mm -hmm. with a lift or with a crane or something like that, just mm -hmm. because we cannot carry these things. Yeah. And the filters itself, they can be carried. Indeed, they are a little bit heavy, about 50 kilograms, mm -hmm. but they can still be carried. And they are rather close to the um, to the cable under test itself, which is below here. In the mm -hmm. they call that a basement. Mm -hmm. um, the cable is coming from here, and this is where the where the filters are located. Right. Here. So you will, yes, you will have to have to use connection cables. Our connection cables coming from the top mm -hmm. to the to the bottom. But uh, you will not have to set up the whole uh, system in the basement. So mm -hmm. to say. Okay, so now I get it. So you you install your your test equipment and just connect it to the cables, and then you, you have shown us the the different the resonance testing, the very low frequency testing, and the twenty four hour soak test. So you have different ways of of measuring if the cable is working fine, more or less. Or actually, general, actually, our system only works with the resonant test. We, we only specify in, in resonant testing because uh, from our experience, it is the method which um, together with the partial discharge me measurement um, has the best chance of finding any problems in the cable. Mm -hmm. um, okay. the, the, benefit, the benefit of resonant testing is that it's, it's rather close to the actual operation we mm -hmm. usually usually when we use test systems we we test we adjust the frequency in between uh, 20 to 300 hertz mm -hmm. which is still rather close to the um to the actual um working frequency of 50 to 60 hertz um and and doesn't have to do anything with 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 dc like like mm -hmm. uh, vlf would do and the the 24 hour soak test as, as i said it's it's more like more or less like okay let's let's switch on the light mm -hmm. and look if there's any problem if if the light uh, shines or not will it be stable all the time like exactly yeah, always exactly the same condition yeah, yeah. the usually the problem uh, with such cables is not so much a a failure that happens um directly on engaging the voltage mm -hmm. but more or less a, a, a problem that evolves over time for instance like a, a little bit of a failure in in the cable itself mm -hmm. you will not see that uh, during engaging the voltage but you will see it uh, with a pd measurement pd measurement mm -hmm. uh, means that uh, small electrical disturbances are measured with a high voltage so to say mm -hmm. Okay, and um, that actually brings me more or less to my to my last question. Um, so, you, well, how to say you you won't rent the these systems or you you don't place them over there just for the testing period, so, but they are really installed there and they will stay there forever and and probably measure and 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 control the the, the cables during the whole lifetime. Wow. Uh, no, actually not. No, actually not. They are mm -hmm. since they are so mobile. They mm -hmm. are uh, installed during the testing time by a service company. Mm -hmm. uh, the service company will own the test system mm -hmm. uh, all the time, and they will move from different collector stations uh, doing after installation tests or um, maintenance tests also. Although the, the standard uh, does not say anything about maintenance testing yet, there have been... Uh, recommendations by mm. the uh, Siegel so far that uh, maintenance can also be performed on cables and they have they have given a, a sort of orientation in the technical brochure about that mm. um, and so yes it's, of it's course not really a, an obligation to, to test the cables no. during the whole operation but it's let's say recommended to do so we would recommend we were or let's say or let's say personally I would recommend to test um, a cable every every two to five years mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. uh, especially the ones which are critical like um like the the export cable over here mm -hmm. um, you see that if one if one uh of these array cables mm -hmm. fails you lose a string yeah. one of 20 yeah. but if that export cable fails you lose fails you lose the whole wind farm yeah. at least for so long as this cable is not in operation mm -hmm. Okay, and then of course you would have to shut down the whole wind farm, and all exactly. your investment exactly. go, would go downwards. Of course, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, okay. So now I got it. 
So great, it's it's an interesting uh, technology. And maybe one last uh, word, Mr. Eifland. Um, who are your your principal customers? How to say? Yeah. Our principal customers, like uh, for us as a company, mm -hmm. are cable manufacturers because we we help them in the design stage with the type and pre-qualification tests. We help them in the uh, manuf after manufacturing with the routine tests, and we help them with after installation tests. Also, mm -hmm. also transformer companies, same thing. Mm -hmm. During the design phase, um, after um, after the the manufacturing and also uh, during installation or for mm -hmm. maintenance on site also. Mm -hmm. Universities are our uh, esteemed customers as well for um, high voltage testing of any kind of, uh, uh, so of, of, of any sort or uh, research institutes like, um, like um, how do you say like- um, Braunhofer and others probably. Exactly, or... exactly. Like uh, mm -hmm. the, the governing institutes that um, are like forming national test labs and, and stuff yeah. yes mm -hmm. okay great so thank you very much mr Eifland, and i'm sure pleasure. there will be quite some potential for your uh, technology of course it's not one which would be installed everywhere but i mean there's enough offshore all over the world and and i mean this is not only for offshore of course we we only spoke right now about about yep those connections for, for offshore connection. But of course, as you said, it's, it's in general high voltage testing equipment. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. all right. So thank you very much and um, sending Ple my best regards to you. <laughs> Pleasure was on mine. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And um, now, oh, sorry, I don't have to share my screen. Um, now, as we already have heard about how to connect those um, offshore wind parks, um, to, to the main grid, more or less, or, or how we could uh, make this stable and secure. I would like um, to welcome our next speaker. It's uh, Mr. Markus Rosenthal from the German Energy Storage Systems Association. And right now he has already joined us. So hello, welcome, Markus. So, hello, thank you very much for the invitation. A uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, it's always kind of um, interesting to learn more about how which kind of challenges in the real world exist. Uh, yeah. But it reminds me a lot about the regulation and politics, about yeah. which I'm going to talk about. I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but of course, always it's, it just seems like plug and play and everything like Lego, but no, there's way <laughs> more behind that. And uh, This is just the whole industry, which is not so visible to all of us, but it's, as we see, very important for the stability yeah. of the whole system. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, so, so please, you, you can share your screen. Um, yeah. Marcus, and um, yeah, I, I could just uh, already announce your, your presentation. It's about the energy storage policy of the European Union and Germany. And um, well, you will have some, some statistics, some views, some re regulations. So please go ahead, Marcus. Yes, thank you very much. Um, plug and play is uh, kind of the right wording already, uh, kind of very good starting point. Uh, we just had elections uh, in Germany uh, at the national level, and we wrote a paper where we also said uh, we need plug and play solutions for energy storage. Um, the reason is very simple. At the moment, it is um, most of our companies are earning a bit of money in Germany. They usually have the headquarter in Germany, but kind of are better off in other countries, shall it be other EU member states or on a global scale, uh, including Latin America. And um, I will give you the presentation after that. You will understand why we are in desperate need for some regulatory changes. So. I just show you just briefly about our uh, our, our association. Um, we are kind of the industry association representing all kinds of storage technologies, very important to us, because many believe we either do only uh, hydrogen or hydro or batteries. No, we do all of them. Um, that's sometimes a bit challenging um, because kind of, um, it's kind of makes things slightly more let's say interesting and also complicated, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, regarding the regulation, um, all, all, the, all the kind of different technologies are treating badly at the same time. So that's fair in a way. Um, and very important for us is kind of we do work at the national EU and the international level. Um, so we're very pleased at least to be here yeah, uh, in a digital way. But uh, usually if there's no virus around, we are happy to travel in the medium person. 
this is a few of our members. Um, so I just go to the uh, key challenges we have uh, within Germany. The last government has decided that kind of we want to be uh, climate neutral by 2045. Um, that's kind of still a way to go. Um, and now I come to the kind of key point from our point of view, what's very important. Um, first of all, what is energy storage? Um, I always like to quote private sector companies, uh, which can give a kind of simple, easy, straightforward definition. Energy storage absorbs and then releases power so it can be generated at one time and used at another. So you might think, well, why is Mr. Rosenthal reading this out? Uh, that's simple because I want to emphasize the case of energy is produced, generated, and at a later time is used. We have um, at the EU level, um, um, kind of, which is very important to Germany as we kind of are joining and pooling our powers uh, within the EU together with 27 other member states, also energy policy. And there's also a clear definition, slightly more bureaucratic, but basically saying the same energy storage in this case for the electricity system um, means that deferring of deferring of an amount of the energy that was generated to the moment of use either as final energy or converted into another energy carrier. So that's slightly more bureaucratic, but kind of easy to understand. Um, the reason why I'm talking about this kind of because we have at the national level a completely different um, definition of what energy storage is. I didn't want to display it here just want to, to talk briefly about it. Our government believes very strongly that kind of energy storage is generation of energy and the last use of energy. All, all our engineers and um, kind of people with kind of a technical or uh, kind of um, electric backgrounds are kind of think our government is mad um, because kind of how can a storage units generate energy? The reason is very simple. Uh, the government is kind of making money out of this definition. I will come later to this in slightly more detail. What is very important, energy storage is very disruptive. Um, price for storage are declining in the battery area by about 10%. Um, hydrogen, it's between 2% to 5%. Um, we see storage, of course, has electrons, uh, electricity, that's about 20% of the current uh, energy market in Germany, and gas, that's about kind of 35%, uh, including biogas. Um, we are, have one mega trend which we see all over the world uh, the combination of renewables with storage, uh, very straightforward because the sun sh doesn't shine at the night. And um, we are kind of, I always say jokingly, secretly working because it rains so much in Germany on the, on the rain uh, power station. So to turn rain into energy, uh, but uh, we are still in the beginning. Um, but at the end of the day, kind of, we have the volatile renewable energy and um, uh, energy storage simply helps to, to smoothen the overall process. And energy storage secures the quality of supply. That's very important. That's one of the things where the European Union is very clear about. Um, it says we need security of supply and energy storage is contributing to that. Um, just briefly, a few figures about uh, energy consumption in Germany. It's about 460 billion uh, kilowatt hours. Um, expected uh, this year, it's expected to be this year, overall 561 billion kilowatt hours, so an increase by 3%. Um, <clears throat> and as I said already, kind of about 20% is electricity. Storage capacity, um, we do have some figures which are more reliable than the government figures, but um, the overall numbers is about 0.2%. Uh, we, of course, are keen to increase this number. Um, just briefly about kind of the key objectives in uh, for for hydrogen, um, green hydrogen in Germany. The government has decided, or the poss possible new government, they may get into office next week, uh, to have 10 gigawatts of uh, hydrogen um, in 2030, and the EU has uh, kind of the objective to achieve 40 gigawatts. Um, I don't want to talk too much about hydrogen. Just kind of. Um, 
kind of one key feature, green hydrogen uh, out of renewable energy is usually more expensive, but prices are declining. The reason why I say usually is kind of, for, for instance, if two companies which are very successful to produce uh, renewable energy just have the electrolyzer next door um, and then also have kind of a fueling station next door, um, they charge uh, or kind of they, they fuel, uh, use the fuel for buses. Uh, they have clients uh, from the public sector for transport and um, they are kind of already um, kind of very successful in terms of earning money with their product, which goes very cheaply because they don't have to transport the product. Um, if you say kind of, if you think about kind of that's about maximum 50 meters uh, between the production, the electrolyzer to the petrol station. Um, <clears throat> one of the main challenges, um, and it seems to me as kind of I'm, I'm doing this international work uh, with lots of pleasure, but kind of uh, the German map seems to be kind of reflected in many, many countries across the world. Sometimes uh, you have energy production kind of in the, in the, rather in the west or in the east, uh, but we have lots of wind energy uh, in the north and that's really where the bulk of energy is coming from. But we have the industry uh, in the south. Uh, there we have solar power. That's the reason why it's, why it's yellow, but solar power in overall terms is not generating as much energy as wind energy. So one of the key features which we also see across the world is um, that we uh, kind of are leaving the system behind us where you have a huge power station which is producing energy at all different levels um, from 400 kilowatts kind of with the really chunky uh, cables um, down to kind of, you know, the, the small grid in the house. Um, that's good old world from our point of view. And that is a new world. And that's something which we see a lot across the world. Um, it doesn't matter if we are in Sub-Sahara, uh, if I'm going to Mala or, or in, in Berlin, Germany where we um, kind of um, where we uh, kind of have the production of energy to generation of energy kind of um, at houses at kind of local local areas and then the energy is kind of moving at the same level between let's say two houses or kind of between um, a PV station and and, and, and and kind of a village. Um, what is needed nowadays, kind of, if you think about your own car, you kind of went to the petrol station, bought fuel, uh, uh, filled, the, filled the tank about five minutes. Um, just one, one thing I want to mention, um, kind of, we have now ultra high power charging companies like BP, uh, which are kind of also a member of our association, are very good in this because kind of they come from the old petrol experience and now do electricity. Um, but they, what they want to do is, uh, or kind of that's the new market is now this uh, fast charging, ultra fast charging, that kind of they um, make the energy available when it's needed. And they can charge up to 50 cars a day with one charging station. The reason is very simple. The charging station has an energy storage unit within it. Um, so there's no problem with kind of the small wires which are available. The key is kind of to make the energy available at the time when it is needed. <clears throat> so I just briefly want to talk about the grids. It's also an issue across the world. Not all grids are reliable. The jump one is reliable, but kind of uh, we have too little grid um, to transport the energy from the north to the south. And I always say this kind of Thomas Edison has invented the electricity grid, uh, marvelous, but he has forgotten to invent the energy storage uh, uh, units and kind of the technology. Uh, that's now our task to do this. I already talked about the prices. It just kind of illustrates kind of the decline in prices, kind of slightly older numbers, but anyway, you get the point the prices are decreasing. Um, on the other hand, we see an increase uh, that's kind of from uh, Bloomberg. Um, they kind of uh, come up every year, basically with the same same numbers. Uh, what's very interesting is that, uh, and we see this uh, from our association's point of view, kind of amongst our members, 
the investments are really going through the roof. Um, everybody wants to invest. Um, that's kind of very, very important. Um, and uh, definitely a market uh, which is growing at this, at this very time. I talked about the grid briefly. The, one of the key problems we see with the grid, the, the grid is a one trick pony. It's kind of only kind of supply uh, electricity. If you have a smart, uh, a smart, um, a smart unit uh, linked to it, then it kind of may help you to manage uh, things. But um, but that's kind of um, that's that's it. And we just put down a few points of what kind of uh, a storage unit can do. And I don't want to go through the whole list now. Uh, this, by the way, is really a selection. But if you see peak load smoothing, uh, black start capability, inertia reserve, voltage control, backup energy, and so on and so forth, um, there's a lot of things where you can use energy storage. And we always say energy storage uh, always come as a price. Tech uh, linked, uh, you know, attached to it, it's no question. But uh, if you have the right application, you know, it's worth investing into it because you get so many benefits. And this is just simply to illustrate again um, one of the key advantages. One advantage of energy storage it's kind of, of course, you you always kind of have the energy available when you need it, and that's kind of really important. So I just want to go really through kind of. Um, kind of just about a few things about uh, on, on, on the benefits of energy storage, um, self-consumption rate, if you have energy storage in the house, in the hotel, in the office, uh, or in the quarter, kind of, you know, more and more buildings linked together, self-consumption rate goes up to 70% uh, compared to 35%. Um, here are a few numbers. The only number I want to talk about really is the increase of self-sufficiency that's kind of for homeowners uh, in Germany, one of the main reasons why they're investing um, into energy storage at homes. Okay, this is a collection of kind of a few of our members, uh, kind of lo lovely residential storage market uh, units, how they look like slightly better than the kind of usual energy storage unit in, in the industry sector, which uh, usually energy storage units are gray. Um, more importantly, uh, we have an increase of numbers um, to kind of 200,000 units have been sold in, in 2020. Uh, we see about this number uh, in 2021, and that's kind of very interesting. We see the coronavirus has increased demand for energy storage, uh, kind of like mad, uh, especially those companies which are producing within Germany. They were, of course, kind of unclear at the beginning of Corona what's going to happen, but then they had the problem that they had to go to three shifts per day because they needed to produce uh, so many units um, to, to kind of meet the demand. Um, we have about a thousand projects for in the industrial energy storage markets, kind of our kind of bigger units. Um, this market is also increasing. Um, one of the important things is the mention and balancing of the grid um, in terms of what a factory uh, needs, really reliable reliability is kind of very important. And this picture gives you a bit of a taste. I couldn't have shown you this kind of, well, if you look at the bottom left, 2014, there was no real energy storage um, at industrial scale uh, within Germany. So this is now we're talking now seven years later, um, it's even above the 430 megawatt, um, tells you this market is growing. Um, so we have three key developments. We see new technologies, storage definitely is a game changer and multi-use uh, models. Um, these are kind of few uh, of the new technologies, Redux flows, super capacitor, capacitors. Um, it's kind of, you know, extremely different technologies which are kind of available nowadays. And we always say, uh, just inform yourself um, and then go for the right option. There is not this one single battery. There's not this one single hydro or hydrogen solution. Um, we even have kind of excellent hydrogen uh, fueling stations nowadays, uh, which are generating electricity. So you use hydrogen to produce electricity, uh, in this case for lorries uh, in Switzerland, and um, 
it's kind of a feasible project. Um, very important is we see, of course, storage as a game changer. Um, electricity turned into molecules, power to heat, power to gas, um, for mobility, for heating, for cooling. Um, that's kind of these are the kind of key features where where we can use future renewable energy and the link between the different sectors. That is really kind of what makes it much more interesting. Uh, we don't talk about a, a gas market in future anymore and an electricity market that's going to be integrated. And um, I couldn't resist it uh, to use for this presentation kind of a slide of one of our members uh, uh, advertising cars, um, but kind of um, this, is, this is kind of a high, uh, high speed, uh, high ultra speed charging station, um, which kind of nowadays you link to your house. Um, because you have a PV uh, kind of um, uh, PV on your roof and you use better storage, you use the heat pump, and then you do heating, cooling, light, and the electric electric vehicle is charged. That is kind of the new reality. Um, so this is kind of I just want briefly um, taking a, <laughs> taking at the watch just briefly come back to uh, the regulatory issue because it's kind of uh, very important in all the countries across the world. Um, we have a renewable energy directive um, which says such consumption of energy shall not be subject to discriminatory, discriminatory procedures. Very important. We see this across Europe. Um, Self-consumption is still something which is not common. And if you do it by yourself, that's okay. But if you want to share something with your neighbor, you are already kind of in a gray area where uh, kind of you possibly need additional permissions. So it's all very complicated and bureaucratic. That's the reason why the EU is saying uh, we need to get rid of discrimination um, for self-consumption. And... Uh, <clears throat> What also is very important for us is kind of the market design directive distribution system operators shall not be allowed to own, develop, manage, or operate energy storage. Uh, very important to us that they kind of focus on their core business and don't mess around now with energy storage units. Um, <clears throat> I already talked about the regulation in the beginning, uh, about different definition of um, about from the German government. The key, as I said, uh, the government wants to make some money, and indeed we have double charges um, for for energy storage. And the EU is saying we need to get rid of this, and it's a very complicated process to get rid of this. And we also are fighting for a definition for storage next to the generation transport and consumption. So what we see is kind of in the German case and the European case is uh, the EU is raking, making the right noises uh, to provide investment security, uh, uh, giving a clear path for technology development, reduce costs for in energy imports and increase security of supply. And to be honest, this is uh, according to our experience, which what is mattering to investors, to um, producers of energy storage. Um, across the world, and um, that's kind of the key, and always make sure that you get the right, right regulation. So that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Markus. That was indeed a very nice and uh, broad presentation, but um, I really liked it. Um, I don't know. Actually, to be honest, we don't have too much time for questions, so maybe I would just uh, take one or two of my own. Um, you've shown that the global investment in, in storage system is increasing dramatically. Um, just, just a short question. Is this investment in research or really in, in on-site operating systems? On-site operating systems. And um, I just really want to point out it's one, for instance, one project which also matters to German companies where in the uh, country of Namibia, the government has now decided uh, together with, uh, with, with the, um, um, the, the European Investment Bank and uh, other public banks to invest 9 billion euros. Um, mm -hmm. That's about 9.5 9 billion uh, dollars uh, into uh, hydrogen development. So what they're going to build, a wind farm and then hydrogen uh, for the country itself, but also to then transform it in, into ammonia uh, and then it's kind of transported possibly to 
to other markets, maybe to Europe, maybe to other parts where, mm. where, where it's better. Um, and uh, same applies for batteries. Uh, we see kind of across the world, um, doesn't really matter if it's China or um, I just, you know, before Corona, I've been to Guatemala and was very interesting. The kind of rural areas uh, have micro microgrids with batteries and solar panels. And the combination of a kind of solar panel, microgrid, and battery allows communities, allows businesses, um, which are kind of really don't have any link to any mm. power station whatsoever because there's no cable, uh, but they allow them to kind of, you know, make business and yeah. to watch television in the evening. I mean, this is what <laughs> matters to, yeah. to people and they like to watch. Or the head. kids could learn for school. At yeah. Least. Yeah. Or they want to yeah. know wh how yeah. Bayern Munich has played. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, that, yeah. That, that was maybe just yeah. just also very yeah. short. But um, you you've also shown the the, the picture with um, a usual a regular house with PV and which which has around thirty five percent of self exactly. consumption. Yeah. And then if you add a battery, you can ramp up to to seventy percent of self consumption. Yeah. And and that was also something that I thought that. Yeah, for, for islands or for, for decentralized rural areas, mm -hmm. of course, they, they can also secure their energy supply for, for the night or for the next two days, Absolutely. at least, something like that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it, yeah. it always comes, you know, it's, it's very straightforward. Um, uh, about you know, 50 years ago, nobody would have thought to build uh, a simple windmill. Nowadays, mm -hmm. it's everywhere in the world very common. 50 years ago, nobody was thought to have a PV panel. You know, now it's yeah. across the world, it's very common. I, I just been to, to Africa, um, you know, you just go to the rural communities and straightforward. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, uh, people just want to use it uh, at night. And um, But they also always want to make the case as a kind of private personal interest um, as well as a business interest. Mm -hmm. And security of supply is so important for in so many parts of the world yeah. um, because the grid is kind of quite often wobbly for many reasons, yeah. you know, and people are simply fed up with that. And if you are a company owner, let's say kind of you have a small company, 10 people are working for you, you produce goods for your local community, which you want to sell, but you can't do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Business owners, you know, small business, they completely fed up and they kind of simply yeah. take the money uh, and invest into energy storage yeah. because then they, yeah, they, yeah, they don't yeah. have to rely on the, services yep. or, or not really working services of exactly. a company they just do it on their own like yep. yeah yep. great great all right marcos thank you very much for your presentation My um, unfortunately we have to move on but i would have so much many more okay. questions thank but, you very um, much yep. I, I would love to share your presentation and your contact data as well with our participants if that's fine for you yeah okay your microphone is off but you know that that seems nice Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, and um, now we will switch a little bit the topic, but we will still stay on the same page or at least in the same book. Um, Marcos has already told us that energy storage is not only electricity, it can also be gas. So why not look at a company which is involved in this topic? So I would like to welcome Boris Solid from the company Biogas Hochreiter. Hello, Boris. Thank you, Ferdinand. Um, like our Carpendale, we'll say uh, hello again. <laughs> so I hello think again. we met several times in the past, so yes. here I am again. So yeah. thank you very so, much to talk to yeah. you. Yeah, please go ahead, Boris. I don't want to, to interrupt you. You can just start with your presentation. Just my two words. Um, it's, it's about the topic of bioenergy. And well, as I said, of course, bioenergy is biogas. So it's also some kind of energy which could be stored. So we are still in the same topic. So um, please show us your solutions for, for bioenergy systems. So I think my screen works. You see my presentation? Uh, not yet in full screen. Oh, I have it in full screen already. Yeah, but we, we can't see it. So maybe maybe stop your screen sharing and then start again the sharing with the full screen. This should work. Uh, there we are. No. Nope. Doesn't like it. <laughs> Horrible. Okay, oh. give me a second. Um, Will that work? No. Nope. Horrible. 
just give me a second I can maybe also share your presentation from my side and you can just give me a hint when I should move through the slides no problem so maybe I just ask uh, just begin with my yeah. introduction of the company um, I will stop my sharing I guess um, yeah, yeah yeah I will I will share in a second from my side yeah. Um, yeah, by Gas Hochreiter, we are, yeah, company, like Ferdinand already said, um, producing biogas plants, designing biogas plants, delivering technology to biogas plants. Um, now it gets easier. Yeah, there we are. So you see what we do, what we are able to do and what we have already done. It was nice to, to hear the presentation of Marcus about energy storage. So biogas, like Ferdinand said, is the simple way of doing it. So we store the, or we used, we use the stored sun energy uh, stored in the plants um, and produce biogas out of that. Um, next slide, please. And um, what we can also do is, you can see that picture, that's a little bit of a sketch where the cows shout at another cow, um, that she's an energy waster because the manure is not used in the biogas plant. It's, it's uh, yeah, <laughs> fallen onto the ground without any usage. So that's what we do across the globe with our technology, using existing energy and converting it into electricity or biogas, biomethane. Next one, please. Um, the company itself is yeah one of the pioneers of the biogas business in Germany. On the top left picture, you see my boss in front of his first engine um, more than 35 years ago, producing seven kilowatt of heat for his farm and one year later, seven kilowatt of electricity for the farm. There was no technology available during that time. So he had to develop and, and, and find technology to keep his plants running, to increase the output. That gained some interest from surrounding farmers and, and, and then it went international and he was able to sell CHP units like you see on the top left, the top right pictures. During the time the plants grow, the output has grown, there were challenges, we had to develop new technologies. That's what you see on the bottom pictures, feeding equipment, large mixers. So we adapted the technology to the new challenges to the new efforts of the clients or of the market. Next one. Um, the plants are quite flexible, so we can use the energy, the existing energy contained in, I call it animal leftovers like manure or slurry from cows, pigs, chicken, like energy crops, which is famous in Germany. Let, let's say the sun power, the sun energy in the plant, like maize, like wheat, like grass, organic residues from, yeah, from household waste, from supermarket waste, food processing residues from bakeries, from slaughterhouses. And this brought us to at least over 1,800 biogas plants, which we delivered, plant or built. So there's quite an experience which we gained. And through that projects, we also, um, yeah, we also had some challenges which we were faced to and we found the solutions. Um, we are sure about that. So we think we found them. On the next slide, please, um, I will show you some of them. So biogas is quite a, an old technology. We can use a lot of organics, like I said, but all these organics have their challenges. For example, manure with straw or silage or grass or any kind of problematic material is hard to mix. So therefore we develop these mixers, um, strong and reliable, can mix hydrometer contents. And as you see, they are quite huge. On the next slide, you will see also a solution for feeding equipment to feed these raw material um, and to, yeah, to keep the plant up and running um, reliably. The next one um, is showing a different, the next slide is showing a different um, 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 technology for getting rid of um, settlements like bones, like sand, like stones, glass or metals. So this is technology is famous in food waste plants. So the existing energy in food waste, which is at the moment dumped on 
yeah, on 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 um, landfills can be used to produce renewable energy. So it does not produce CO2 and especially the more dangerous methane and release to the atmosphere. So we produce it, we capture it, and we produce energy out of that. That's a technology really needed in these kind of applications when it's when we are talking about waste or chicken manure, because chicken manure is containing sand, which will settle down and create problems. So we can get rid of that settlements during the process without stopping the plant. Next slide, please. Um, we also manufacture our own CHP units where we convert the biogas into electricity. So we have our own workshop, 550 kilowatt is the limit which we can produce based on MAN and Deutz engines. Above that, we go with MWM and Jenbacher. Next one. Um, like I said, the plant is quite flexible on, on <coughs> sorry, on input material. So food waste is a really big opportunity at the moment, moment which we recognize worldwide, where there are now states, communities are facing uh, to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by CO2 and methane and reduce the, uh, the landfill tonnages um, yeah, to, 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 to keep the, the emissions low. So food waste, like you see on the top left picture, is the green bin, we call it in Germany, with household waste, which we can process on the top. Uh, <coughs> sorry for that. Bottom left picture, you see packed food waste from supermarkets and the the other picture is um, food processing residues. So that could be used in plants, which you will see uh, at the next slide. So that's a sample for such a food waste, organic waste using plant with a reception building where trucks can dump the organic waste. We can depack it, we can downsize it, we can pasteurize it so that there are no problems with bacteria or other contaminants. And then we process it into, or we process it in a normal biogas plant. Next one. Um, a big, <coughs> a big uh, market which we are recognizing at the moment globally is biomethane. And that's another point regarding energy storage as well. You can manufacture, produce the biogas, upgrade it into biomethane. On the picture, you see, see a, a plant from us in France, um, port au -Pin, together with Air Liquide, a membrane unit. And you can store that biomethane in the natural gas grid, in bottles um, or elsewhere. And the next page, you will see a larger facility um, with uh, amin washing unit. So that's for really large units um, above 1,000, 1,500 cubic meters of biogas power. And with that biomethane on the next page, you will see you can inject it either into the gas pipeline on site when a pipeline is nearby, or you can run it with a virtual pipeline and you can transport it to a centralized injection point or to an end user like a fuel station, like industry, or any other kind of end users or cooling systems or something like that on the next page. You will see a really interesting um, project we made in France together with a client and early Keat. So we built a biogas plant, the farmer and early Keat invested in the plant, um, produced biomethane. And on the biogas plant, there is a biomethane fuel station where trucks from a supermarket store, Carrefour, can load their, um, their, their delivery trucks. Um, before they go into the end of the day. So the trucks bypass the biogas plant, stop on the biogas plant, and they are fueling their trucks with bio-CNG. So they are immediately on green fuel. So not like um, batteries or at the moment hydrogen. So we are at but green fuel immediately. So that's a, in my opinion, and in our opinion, the future of biogas, It's it will be, um electricity as well when when the the the, the, the project is um, let's say facing the correct circumstances um, <coughs> but the most projects in future will be dealing with biomethane 
just because of the higher efficiency and the possibility to store energy. On the next page, you will also see um, what we can deliver as well, like um, the whole technology package on a biogas plant. So we do not only do the design, we also deliver, install and commission the technology. We deliver the software, which could be remote controlled um, by our service crew, by ourselves, by yourself, wherever you are. And so that makes you relatively safe in running such a biogas plant because there is always a backup available through remote control. Next slide, please. Um, yes, here's some references. So as you can see, our business is not just Germany. It's more or less mainly Europe, but we also deliver technology to um, Asia, especially here, Thailand, which is a really fast growing market at the moment. That's a plant at Northeast Rubber running on two megawatt electrical output, using the heat to dry rubber and using the electricity on site to run the rubber factory. It's producing the biogas out of Napier grass silage, which is a famous breed for the Asian market. On the next slide, you will see further examples in the UK. So there you see we cannot go only big. 2.4 megawatts, we can go smaller as well, 500 kilowatt, 200 kilowatts. So <coughs> depending on the circumstances, we can adapt our technology and our plant size. On the next ref, uh, reference page, you will see a plant in Turkey, quite famous um, in the case that they use um, maize straw to run the plant. So there is no discussion about uh, food or biogas. Um, the corn is harvested, used for producing food, and the straw is used to produce green energy. The plant is using as well um, some food waste and other input material, but it's also using that kind of maize corn, uh, maize straw, sorry for that. Um, on the bottom, you see Potopin, actually 500 non-cubic non meter of biomethane already. Um, it's a plant in France, which is the one with the um, biomethane, bio CNG fuel station. So now I'm close by the end. On next page, um, you will see what we can offer in Latin America. Um, sadly, we are not, we have not sold anything to the Latin American market or even the whole American market, but we are, <coughs> we are keen to do that. We would like to find new partners. We are in discussion with some people, with some companies, but um, yeah, Latin America is, uh, is, is, is big. We can, definitely find some customers. We can deliver our reliable technology, our reliable biogas plants. You can use local already existing energy, which is at the moment not used. That's quite interesting regarding biogas. And yeah, on the next page, you see that we can um, also, that we search customers, that we offer the solutions and that we are adapted to all the kind of markets. We um, adapt the technology, we adapt the design and we would like to be happy. We are happy if you would like to, or if you come back to us um, regarding a possible project. So, yeah, on the next page, I was I would like to thank you for your attention, for the possibility to talk to you, and that's more or less, yeah, my presentation of the company Hochreiter and a possible biogas technology. Thank you for that. Well, thank you very much, Boris. Um, <laughs> And that was a nice presentation. Just give me uh, one answer. What is what is the flame here? Is this just the biogas flare? Is this always burning that bright? Or no, no, that was that was a nice picture during commissioning of the Green Deal plant in the UK. So, if for example engines are at service or at standstill, you need to flare the biogas, otherwise it will be released to the atmosphere. And that was the commissioning of the biogas plant and the biogas flare. And we actually. If the engines would be at the standstill, we would burn 1,200 cubic meter of biogas per hour with that flare, but that was just commissioning and hopefully it burns not a lot. And should never just burn without being used for, for heat no, no, and no. electricity, of course. Yeah. Then we yeah. burn a lot of money. Yeah, all right, thank you. Um, another question, maybe really please a short answer. I've seen in your, in your presentation, there was food waste with plastic uh, wrappings and, and packages. Yep. This can be used in a biogas plant? Yes, there is the technology to unpack the material with machines. Mm -hmm. So you, you just get the trucks appearing from supermarkets or, or storage facilities or 
yeah, companies producing that mm -hmm. kind of, of, of food and then they dump it into the hopper and we unpack it with the machinery and, gen, and then process it into the biogas plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, well, a last point, this is not really a question. It was just uh, like something that came up to me. I thought, well, why is Biogas Hochreiter not yet um, successful in Latin America? Is it maybe, I don't know, maybe because your prices are way too high over sophisticated German engineering, but no, then you showed us you have already got projects in Thailand. And to be honest, Thailand, they are also very cost sensitive. So I guess this could easily be transferred to, to Latin America for sure. Definitely. So Thailand is in Asia. And as we know, Asia is close. To, uh, China is in Asia. So there is always the price competition th mm. that we all are facing. We did it. They know, they knew that we are not the cheapest one because yeah, of European standards. Europe is the, let's say, price-wise, the highest market on, on the globe. Then there will be uh, Americas and at the end, Asia. So mm -hmm. my boss have been in, for example, in Brazil 15 years ago, but it was just not the time for, for renewable energy 15 years ago in, in Brazil. So now we recognize that in Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, um, all these countries, there is an evolving, a, a growing market for renewables. And there are the big farms, there are the big pig, uh, meat producers, the big agricultural manufacturers, so the, the sugar industry. But at the moment, they have not faced the need to mm -hmm. build these plants. And yeah, maybe we also missed a little bit of the time. But I think now, yeah, we are at the right time to enter the market. And I hope yeah. we, will get, we will get it. Yeah. yeah, let's just hope that this, let's say, window of opportunity will open again and that you will be able to find more partners. And well, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, of course, you're, you're <coughs> welcome to, to speak to Boris. He's also um, an exhibitor of our virtual exhibition. So he's got his booth. Um, of course, we will share your contact data at, um, at least afterwards. Um, of course, I think if, if I Google Boris Deutsch Biogas Hochreiter, I would probably find your contact data as well. But Possibly, of course, yes. we, will, we will share all your data afterwards. So thank you very much, Boris, for now. I wish you the best. And well, I wish you the best for your further um, engagements in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, Ferdinand, and all the other um, participants. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs> In Thank real you. life. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and um, just just fitting to this topic, actually, as we have seen now, um, 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 system solutions for bioenergy. Now we are going more into detail because I want to introduce you to uh, Carlos Olivo. He is the international sales manager of the company Flotvec. Hello, Carlos. Hi, Ferdinand. Thank you very much. You, your team, Verena, Maria, everybody, for letting us present thank you thank you it's and um, well yeah you, you can already try or i wish you good luck to share your presentation and um, i would just say yeah as i said um Flotwig is uh, uh, is a producer for components for bioenergy plants so you will get a little bit more into the details um probably of the system um yeah we can see your presentation please carlos Excellent. go ahead thank you very much well, um, I'm Carlos. I am from the company Flodvec. Our um, company is 60 uh, years in the market already. And well, I'm very glad to be just behind uh, the company Biogas Hochreiter and all the explanations from Boris will make a lot of sense now that I start to explain our technology. Uh, because um, what we have seen is mainly the biogas uh, storage or the biogas production. And there are many different types of plants. Uh, there are many different ways to collect this uh, waste. And this is, like I always say, a holistic problem we have to approach. Um, we have to consider the conditions in every country how we collect the waste, where we put it, how long it stays there, and how much time it's happening between the, the, the production of the waste until it arrives to a biogas plant. So this is what I'm trying to show 
in this uh, in this uh, graphic. Yeah, uh, we can go very detailed, but however, time is limited. Um, we have to work from many many sides. This is my main message to you. So uh, once we get this uh, waste in the plant, well, independently if it's um, uh, just a wastewater treatment plant or if it's a biogas from, I don't know, waste food or restaurant recollection, independently for that, we will produce the biogas, but after that, then we remain with the solids. These solids, once they have produced biogas, methane mainly, well, we have to put them somewhere. And this is where our technology can support you. Flodvik technology is made specifically for this type of difficult to the water type of a sludge. Yeah, we have many references all around the world. Here in Bavaria, very close to our facilities and production site, there is the company called Wurzer. They rely on Flodvik technology to separate the water from the last remainings of their biogas, their biogas uh, waste. And well, this is another type of, of arrangement for a biogas plant where we receive some of the some of the waste, we just prepare it, we go into the reactor, then it goes to a power plant as uh, for example, Hogreiter was producing the CHP units themselves, but then somehow we have to put out the slurry or the sludge. And sometimes we can have an after tank or we can forget about it and go immediately to a, I don't know, waste uh, field. Uh, landfill or or to put it in the agriculture use. So how does it look like again, the types of biogas production reactors? We have some with dry fermentation. We have some with plug, plug type uh, reactors or drained water reactors, okay? So all these technologies uh, are available. However, they produce different type of dryness and different type of, of materials, which at the end we have to remove. We have to take them out from, from these fermenters and then put them somewhere, like I said, in the landfill. Um, we can go through the different types of, of arrangements. I would like to go little by little to the technology. Yeah, we can also have a production from biogas by cattle manure or from other type of animal uh, animal production. So this is also a focus on, on flood lake. Uh, the type of substrates, the type of disposal waste is also related definitely to the local legislation. I was very interested in the question about uh, price-driven price markets. Definitely um, Latin America is not um, interested in creating more environmental problems and the investment is at the moment there. However, without legislation, anybody can do more or less whatever. And this is what uh, we should take care and pay attention to because the knowledge is somewhere there. The legislation is starting, but there must be the right, the right alignment of, of people and, or, or the right alignment of conditions that allow us to have the investment, the people with the technical background, and then obtain the results. Because independently of the experience, we have to deal with the local uh, available technology and available resources. And it's, uh, it's not so easy sometimes to take these risks. So the challenges are there. Uh, we have to learn everyone uh, a little bit from everybody. And however, go for it, take uh, a small project, start a little bit, sometimes like we say from scratch, 
and then start with the technology getting little by little more more of a feeling how it's working this how it's working there and and for that i believe the the rest of the companies showing their products here as well as flotvec uh, we are the, the the partner which you might find uh, that might deliver the technology that might deliver the experience and that might deliver the confidence that the governments and the population need yeah so uh, I'm very glad to show you this, this um, type of arrangements, how we can install our decanter. But sometimes, um, like we say, a list or an image speaks for itself more than words. These are the biogas plants from Floodbeck, reference lists uh, made from uh, just a couple of four or five years. Um, we have obviously in China, in Austria, a lot of them in Germany, for sure. Obviously, Great Britain, Italy, uh, Netherlands, yeah, Malaysia, USA, Poland. So we have a lot of experience dealing with this type of difficult dewater sludge. And if you're looking for a reliable partner, uh, just take a look on our website. You can have my contact data for sure. And we can stay in touch for any specific uh, questions that you may have. Let me go to the inside of the decanter technology. Give me just one second until I find the right video. Jumping from one... Uh, one data to the other, so taking a little bit of time. I didn't integrate it in the presentation. However, it's working a little bit slow. Sorry for that. Well, I'll wait for, for it. Like we said, some of our references, not only on the list, but on the map. Our technology is basically, I know it's not working, the, I cannot pull out the video. Our technology is based on the very strong materials, very different ways of protecting the, the different parts of the technology. They need more or less uh, robustness. Uh, our SIM drive technology is a very smooth way to operate the machine. Uh, as you, if you are already informed about uh, centrifuges or decanters, they travel at uh, 3,000, 2,000 RPMs. So these are very high shear forces. So in order to take out the materials, you have high temperature, high velocity, and this can always uh, have an affection on, on the stress of the material. And that's where we are most suited we can provide a robust equipment, which can uh, have a lifetime at least of 15 years. Uh, we are a family-based company, also providing very good payment conditions. Uh, we are not looking for a sale. We are looking for a partnership. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I cannot pull the videos, but Anyway, uh, I will be very happy if you take contact with me and I can show them to you uh, some internal parts of the, of the decanter. However, uh, just thinking out of the box, just go to YouTube, uh, go to Floodbeck channel. There you will find the different um, internal parts of our machines. And yeah, we are um, top three producers of decanters worldwide. I'm very glad to be here and I'm looking forward to your news in a very short period of time. Okay, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, please feel free to let me know. Thank you very much, Carlos, for your presentation. Um, I've got one, one uh, question to begin with. Um, are you usually working on, on how to say, um, 
brownfield or greenfield investments or usually in the in the upgrading of existing plants we work both we we prepare definitely with engineering companies the coming biogas plants in mm -hmm. switzerland in austria in germany in latin america and we also make a refurbishment upgrade of existing uh, plants where they need a better separation technology, for example. Um, so we are mostly everywhere. We try to be mostly everywhere. Yes. <laughs> everywhere where the business is probably. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah right. that's, uh, we have a lot of, I mean, this is sometimes when you say 60 years in the market, it's very easy to say the sentence, but it means that you have so many relationships worldwide mm -hmm. that you have eyes almost everywhere. So this is uh, the meaning of that sentence. Sometimes mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't pay too much attention to that, but it, that's actually the meaning for me, that mm -hmm. you have relationships where they, you made probably a wastewater treatment plant, and then you made a steel wastewater mm -hmm. treatment plant, and now you made a biogas plant. So mm -hmm. we try to be everywhere, little by little, of course. Uh, we produce a thousand, maybe next year, 1,200 machines per year. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's a good number. Uh, we are a thousand, uh, thousand employees worldwide. So yeah, it's a big team, a lot mm -hmm. of eyes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And um, I, I'm not sure, sorry, maybe I missed it, but do you already also have like a, a real team, a sales team or a projects team in, in Latin America? Yes, this was not part of the presentation, uh, but yes, we have 13 subsidiaries directly mm -hmm. from Floodlake. And in Latin America, we have uh, starting from north to south, uh, Mexico, uh, we have... Um, Floodbig Peru, Floodbig Brazil, and we have a lot of um, representative offices mm -hmm. in every country. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. the main the main ones are in Chile, in Argentina, uh, in Panama. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we are pretty well distributed. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and as as you said, you're not only active for let's say. Pure biogas plant, uh, biogas plants, but also in, in in wastewater treatment. And as you said, this is not only for municipal wastewater, but also for all the different industries, pulp and paper. I don't know, steel industry, exactly. chemical industry, probably as well, etc. Right. That's right. So a, lo a lot of opportunities for you, but also a lot of possibilities to to use your technology to get more sustainable and also more energy or resource efficient for sure. Exactly, yes. And, and the, the technology itself is 95% recyclable. So mm -hmm. uh, this is also part of the payment plans that Floodbeck can offer to our customers. You buy the mm -hmm. machine now, in 10 years you come back, we, we pay you back the old machine and you get mm -hmm. a new one, for, of course, for the differential price. But mm -hmm. this kind of arrangements have been going on for decades in the company. Mm -hmm. So this might be attractive also in Latin America where we have done this kind of deals in many, many ways from mining industry to wastewater treatment plants and now to biogas. So mm -hmm. these are very, very interesting uh, business models. Yeah. So and now my, my last question, and I really ask you for, uh, for a very, very short answer. So do you offer some kind of, of leasing or of flat rate services? Or? That's right. Yes, we can also offer, for example, some sort of uh, purchase. Uh, we call it in German, Kauf auf gut befund, which is mm -hmm. a purchase made or based on results. Mm -hmm. So you can get the machine. If the machine delivers, you start to pay it. If the machine mm -hmm. does not deliver, Flodweg is um, in, the, in the contract, uh, has to get it back without okay. cost for the customer. 
similar more or less to IKEA and their 365 days return guarantee more or less. <laughs> For example, exactly. Yeah. That's right, Ferdinand, yes. <laughs> all right, <laughs> perfect. Thank you very much, Carlos. Of course, I wish you also the best. And um, well, we will share your contact data as well. I have already shared your, your um, YouTube um, the YouTube channel from Flotwick. I will just post it again one more time here in our chat so the people Excellent. got it in front of their eyes. So thank you very much, Carlos. And My pleasure. Time. Thank you. You too. All Bye. the best. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we actually want to do a little shift in our in our uh, focus or topic. Um, we, we've had um, electricity storage. We had... Um, gas storage and generation as well. And now we will come back to, to our um, surrounding um, topic of, of the green transition in the energy structure or in rural and, and decentralized regions as well. And, and Carlos, could you please stop uh, sharing your screen? <laughs> that that's would be great. Um, and that's why I want to welcome Mrs. Sarah Boss from the company Icron. Um, so hi, Sarah, welcome to our event. And um, Hi, you are going to, to show us something and explain us something about the, the small wind turbines that your company is, is um, offering. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you see the presentation? Um, no, we see the wrong window. You have to uh, <laughs> switch uh, if you go to answer. Uh, no. Sorry. Um, Just go in full screen again, and I can help you uh, switch the the panel. That's no problem. Okay. So. I'll just now? switch to German in a second. When du oben auf Anzeigeeinstellungen da drauf klickst, um, dann kannst du da auswählen, die Ansichten vertauschen. Oben in der Mitte. Uh. Okay, ein Moment. Oh, Wenn ich einfach Bildschirm 1 anklick, freigeben, muss das doch eigentlich funktionieren. Ja, yeah, ja. Yeah. Okay. Nee. So, nee, sorry. Klick mal oben auf Anzeige einstellen, direkt über deine Slide. Da, da steht es. Und wenn du da drauf klickst, dann kannst du, ja? Genau, und dann vertauschen. Jawohl, perfekt. So, here you go. Sarah. Okay, perfect. <lacht> um, I'm going to do the presentation presentation in Spanish. Bueno, eh, hola a todos, yo soy Sara y ahora les voy a contar algo acerca de nuestra empresa iCuron. Bueno, nosotros eh, fabricamos pequeños aerogeneradores, como pueden ver aquí. Aquí pueden ver el funcionamiento. Y eh, bueno, nosotros vendemos estos aerogeneradores para la industria, para la agricultura, para el negocio de telecomunicaciones, para la hotelería y también para almac almacenes. Y bueno, Ay, perdón, escucho voces. Ok, perfecto. Bueno, como pueden ver aquí en estas imágenes, nuestros eh, aerogeneradores son bastante pequeños. Aquí el diámetro son de 4.6 metros y de longitud solamente estamos hablando de 3 metros y medio. Y bueno, nuestros aerogeneradores, tenemos aerogeneradores de 2.5 kilovatios o hasta 5 kilovatios. Y la turbina puede producir entre 8.000 y 20.000 kilovatios horas al año. Claramente depende eso del sitio y las condiciones de viento. Y aquí en la esquina también pueden ver un compañero de trabajo que está justo instalando un, una turbina, un generador, para que puedan ver las dimensiones. Realmente es muy pequeño. Bueno, nosotros tenemos la fabricación en Alemania. Tenemos nuestra propia unidad de fabricación. Entonces, todas las partes eh, son diseñadas por nosotros 
y por lo mismo también eh, tenemos todo el control en cuanto a este, especificaciones que quiera el, el, el cliente y también la calidad. Aquí en el medio pueden ver una foto. Eh, no sé si pueden ver mi mouse, esa parte roja. Es con un bobinado que en el fondo produce la energía eléctrica. Entonces, como nosotros también lo producimos, lo podemos ajustar dependiendo de las necesidades del cliente. Si el cliente eh, necesita un aerogenerador de, por ejemplo, 5 kilovatios, nosotros también podemos hacer este bobinado de 5 kilovatios, efectivamente. Bueno, aquí tenemos dos tipos de soluciones que ofrecemos. Ofrecemos la solución off-grid o la solución on-grid. En el caso de la solución off-grid, también viene con el controlador de carga y el dump load. La batería no está incluida. Y en el caso de la solución on-grid, también viene con el inversor, el dump load y el cuadro eléctrico. Nosotros siempre incluimos en nuestros envíos a la electrónica para que el cliente no se tenga que... Este, no tenga que conseguir nada más. O sea, es, es como el, el paquete completo, digamos. Bueno, tenemos diferentes opciones de torres también. Esa es una torre que se llama Bucket System, que nosotros siempre recomendamos y preferimos, porque eh, es sin hormigón y la ventaja de eso es que nos permite instalarlo, o sea, nos permite instalar todo el aerogenerador con... Este, la torre y todo en un par de horas. No necesitamos hacer ningún tipo de trabajo antes. Entonces es mucho más rápido. Y entonces aquí abajo solamente se pone el bucket y luego se llena con varias toneladas de grava. Y ya, luego se pone la torre, eh, se ajusta el, el generador y se sube. Es como un sistema de, de elevación. Pero si el cliente también prefiere un, una solución con hormigón, también podemos ofrecer esto. En este caso, eh, tiene el mismo principio. Tenemos aquí el sistema de elevación. Entonces, bajamos el segmento superior, montamos abajo la turbina y una vez comple completado toda esta instalación, el mástil se levanta de nuevo y la turbina se puede, empe o sea, puede empezar a funcionar. Es bastante sencillo, la verdad. Y por lo mismo no necesitamos ningún tipo de grúa, eh, nada. Y, y como las partes son tan pequeñas, igual podemos llevar todo en una camioneta, que también es una súper ventaja cuando se trata de sitios muy aislados, por ejemplo. Bueno, aquí tenemos un ejemplo de un diseño muy específico de una torre. Eh, aquí tenemos un sitio para una empresa de telecomunicaciones y aquí ya teníamos una estructura de acero existente que utilizamos para montar y conectar nuestra torre. Y aquí funciona con el mismo principio de que usamos una torre de elevación, como pueden ver aquí en las fotos. Bueno, aquí tenemos más fotos eh, eh, de Grecia, eh, en donde instalamos eh, con una empresa de telecomunicaciones, la Deutsche Telekom, estos aerogeneradores y de hecho el próximo año también vamos a empezar en el negocio de telecomunicaciones en Chile este, vamos a tener nuestro primer proyecto en Chiloé aquí tienen más fotos de nuestros aerogeneradores y de hecho aquí a la derecha pueden ver el bucket system como se ve ya implementado y otra ventaja del bucket system es que si el cliente dice por X razón que quiere cambiar la ubicación del aerogenerador, también se puede cambiar. Como no es fijo, como no es de hormigón, como que se puede trasladar el aerogenerador, digamos, por si el cliente lo necesita, digamos. Bueno, ¿cómo hacemos la evaluación de viento? Como primera instancia, revisamos en Google Maps la ubicación, súper sencillo, y usamos páginas públicas como, por ejemplo, Global Wind Atlas o Wind Finder, que todo el mundo tiene acceso a eso, como para revisar primero si este lugar tiene buenas condiciones de viento o no. 
Y ya luego, como segundo paso, utilizamos un sistema profesional de análisis de datos de viento que se llama Meteometrics. Entonces, ¿qué es lo que hacemos con esto? Hacemos varias solicitudes de diferentes alturas, como por ejemplo aquí eh, en esta presentación tenemos el ejemplo de 10 metros, 15 metros y 20 metros. Y luego eh, este sistema nos estima, eh, estima o calcula eh, la producción de kilovatios al año. Entonces, a base de estas cifras, el cliente ya puede evaluar el periodo de recuperación de la inversión para cada sitio específico. Y ya puede ver si vale la pena poner un aerogenerador en esta ubicación o mejor no. Y ya, una vez que el cliente nos dice que sí, eh, este, nos manda fotos de la ubicación y nosotros comprobamos y revisamos este sitio para ver en qué lugar específico ponemos la torre. Damos también recomendaciones para que no choque con otros objetos que pueda haber en este sitio. Y bueno, todo esto lo hacemos desde Alemania y luego una vez que ya se concretiza el, el proyecto, nosotros también viajamos a estos países, a estos lugares, a realizar el proyecto en conjunto con el cliente. Bueno, aquí tenemos eh, un ejemplo del sector no relacionado con las telecomunicaciones. Eh, en este caso ganamos el concurso de ENOC, que es la Compañía Nacional de Petróleo de los Emiratos, con sede en Dubái, que construyó en la Expo 2020 una estación de servicio de futuro, así lo llaman. Bueno, aquí pueden ver a la derecha en la foto el techo solar. Y parte del proyecto también era eh, instalar un pequeño aerogenerador, que aquí a la izquierda pueden verlo, o sea, es, es nuestro pequeño aerogenerador. Y aquí también pueden ver un pequeño video de la estación. Y bueno, en este caso eh, instalamos este aerogenerador pequeño con una torre de 22 metros, para que se puedan hacer una idea. Y ya, esa era la presentación. Si tienen cualquier duda, me pueden mandar un correo o mandarme un WhatsApp, no hay ningún problema. Y muchísimas gracias por su atención. Thank you very much, Sarah, for your presentation. Um, it's great to see that the first project in Chile is underway. And of course, that's my first question. Tell me more about it. Yeah, well, um, bueno, voy a responder en español. Um, <ríe> sí, exacto. Tenemos nuestro primer proyecto con, un, um, con una empresa de telecomunicaciones en Chile. Y uh, en este caso va a ser una solución off-grid. Y uh, esperemos instalar o realizar este proyecto en enero o febrero del próximo año. Y ya luego el plan es también este, enfocarnos en otros países en Latinoamérica. Hasta ahora no estamos en Latinoamérica, eh, pero nuestro primer proyecto va, va a ser en Chile. Estamos hasta ahora en el sur África, este, en Grecia, eh, en Alemania, en Suiza. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And um, one, one or two more questions. Um, what's, what's the smallest um, size in, in, in capacity in, in kilowatts uh, of, of your plant and what's the biggest? Um, el rango es entre 2.5 y 5 kilovatios. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And um, also one last question is about uh, the wind conditions that you need to, to set up your plants. Uh, is this similar to, to regular huge uh, on and offshore plants or do you just have completely different uh, levels of wind that you need? Claro. Como los aerogeneradores son más pequeños y por lo mismo también los instalamos en torres mucho más, eh, o sea, no tan altos como los aerogeneradores grandes que conocemos, necesitamos eh, cierto nivel de, de viento para que realmente haga sentido por un, eh, visto de, por un visto económico. O sea, nosotros recomendamos que a partir de 5 metros por segundo eh, ya podemos empezar a hablar 
eh, o podemos empezar a ver si es un buen sitio para instalar un aerogenerador pequeño. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much, Sarah. And well, we are thrilled to see how the project goes in, in Chile and hopefully next year or so, or, so, or, or in two years, you will, you will tell us that it's successful and that the, the Chilean telecommunication um, provider has ordered 20 more of your of your wind power plants. Hopefully. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Sarah, and I wish you the best. <laughs> you too. Bye. Goodbye. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's it for our um, first session uh, on the topic of green transition in the energy uh, infrastructure. Of course, we will still stick to this topic more or less in general to sustainability, energy efficiency and renewable energies. Um, right now, I would like to open our next session. Um, it's our last session actually of our virtual trade fair for this week and year as well. Um, it's about the topic of green tech solutions for smart cities. And um, I would like to invite our first speaker, or actually our first two speakers, because they will work together. It's um, Mr. Luis Mola from Mola Architects and Dr. Uh, Dr. Günther Lönert from um, Solidar Planungswerkstatt. Welcome to the panel. Mr. Mola and Mr. Um, Leonard, um, give me a second. So now you should be able to activate your camera as well. Hello. Hmm. Can you hear us, Dr. Leonard? Yes, I can. Okay, perfect. And uh, it's, it's perfect for you as well? Yes, yes, we can understand you clearly. So feel free to, to share your presentation. Yes. And, and tell us more about the first plus energy building in Latin America, the so-called urban living map. Please. Could you go into full screen, please? System gets slow. Sie müssen ganz unten rechts auf dieses ähm, Präsentationsmodus starten gehen. Okay. Ah, okay. Und dann klicken Sie jetzt bitte einmal da auf Anzeigeeinstellungen, Herr Lönert, und wechseln Sie auch noch einmal den Bildschirm. Oben in der Mitte steht Anzeigeeinstellungen. Klicken Sie da bitte einmal drauf. Herr Löhner? Ja, wir sind hier. Genau, da, genau. Klicken Sie da mal drauf und dann nochmal vertauschen. Ja. Und dann sollten wir es in Vollbild auch sehen. Jawohl, perfekt. The stage is yours, Mr. Löhner. Okay. So our, uh, our topic is Urban Living Lab, which is a much broader consideration of uh, sustainability, not only technologies and so forth, And um, and uh, we have the presentation. We did our presentation in two parts. Um, one is the concept and the idea, the overall idea of uh, the, the urban living lab. My name is Günter Lönert, and I'm an architect in Berlin. And uh, the second part is the realization in Puebla, which will be presented by uh, my colleague, Luis. Well, we talk about um, urban living lab, which is dedicated to be a competence center for sustainable development. And uh, what is the idea? The, the, the background is more or less uh, a very, very Uh, rapidly growing public awareness requ uh, which requires such a competence center. The uh, Urban Living Lab is dedicated to be an incubator and model role as a competence center for future cities. There are well two main locations or, or types of location. Universities, campus universities, for instance, which are very close to um, 
education, research and industry, and very city centers, attractive places for information, exhibition, consulting, cultural offers to the, to the public. And of course, the building itself is an accessible exhibit plus innovation space and stage for launching all kinds of projects addressing sustainability. Innovative or innovation is a, another issue very important. These competence centers include a holistic quality transfer towards sustainability. They should be a role model. They should be have an outstanding and global appeal, should be transparent, have transparency of overall performance. And of course, they have to be monitored because the performance of sustainable buildings are very, very important. <clears throat> Urban living labs are also dedicated for dissemination of innovative products and technologies. And of course, to realize such uh, uni, uni, um, uh, urban labs, uh, an integrated design process is necessary. Sorry, uh, integrated design process is uh, necessary in an interdisciplinary way. Efficiency the huge energy saving potential by urban areas. A global co co collaboration of interdisciplinary research is necessary, including future generations. These efficiency goals and requirements listed here are valid for, valid for every location all over the world because they are generic. They are really for every situation. But of course, they must be met by different means, depending on climate conditions and many, many other frame conditions. So you can see there are 13 issues from bioclimatic design through efficiency, energy efficiency, daylighting, mobility, monitoring, user coaching, and so forth. International. The Urban Living Lab is in very, very city centers or university campus locations also include both new buildings and refurbishment. Urban Living Lab realizations in different climates should create networks in R&D for transfer and knowledge. The poor, uh, there are two locations, three, three locations of special interest. The first is uh, Seoul, which is a forerunner of an urban living lab, and Puebla, which will be presented by my colleague. The holistic approach is another, is another issue, very, very important. Sustainable construction assessment which will be done by uh, these main criteria of the German uh, assessment systems. And the most important is the quality of life, which should be met for uh, the urban living labs, of course. Uh, by the way, and not mentioned here, the sustainable certification of buildings and districts is the best return of on investments. This is our experience. Here you can see the data on the project development. It started in 2016, presentations in Havana and uh, the start of uh, the Puebla project. Currently we are focusing on site and funding acquisition. We realize very positive responses on the concept of competence centers for sustainable, for sustainable development, even in small towns. And you are invited to contact us for further um, for further con for further contact and fur further um, discussion on different locations. Here you can see all the content of my short presentation in a flyer, which will be distributed to you, which will be uh, provided by a download link. And uh, this is page number two. 
And we have an extension on uh, urban living labs, which is uh, called Great Good Places. You probably know this from uh, Ray Oldenburg, an American uh, professor. And uh, these features of um, Great Good Places or Third Places, they include neutral ground. They include open to broad levels of population, conversation, simple to reach, regular visitors, optics not above function, playful mood, and a section home. So finally, you can see here a selection of current projects. There are th three in Berlin and, uh, and surroundings. And all these features and principles will be met by almost all these projects. However, we will pro uh, now present only one of this, and this will be done by my colleague, Luis. And I hand over to him. Thank you, Gunther. Um, at this place, I'm, my name is Louis Mola. Um, and I'm an architect in Berlin. And we've been working on this project with Gunther for almost 10 years now. I will briefly explain the project at the Ibero Puebla, which is a collaboration that started during the German-Mexican year and continues until this date. It is both a professional cooperation and an academic cooperation, which we have done with industrial partners through the last few years. Here you see Puebla. Puebla is located um, close to Mexico City. Uh, we have at the center um, uh, the campus of the Ibero, which is on the outskirts of the city, and two other places where we're working on the living lab. There's a fab lab in Analco, which is in the historical center, and Valdeparaiso, an outlying neighborhood, which is a stressed, uh, disadvantaged neighborhood. Um, here you have a zoom of the current um, location, the Ibero campus marked in red, the dot shows where the urban living lab, which is adjacent to the EDIT, which is a fab lab created along the models of the urban, of the um, um, IMIT fab labs. To the north, you see the campus of the Ibero, which is a linear building. In the middle, you see the parking lot. You see that this is basically a, um, urban condition which is um, dominated by uh, disjunction, a series of urban islands. To the north, you see the Atoyac River, which is one of the most polluted rivers in Puebla. And then you see the Ibero again in the center with large infrastructures around it. Here you see a zoom where you see um, the triangle where the urban living lab zero energy building will be located um, on the bottom, the EDIT um, to its left, and then the um, largely paved surface of the Ibero um, in the center of the parking lot and the campus to the north. One of our main uh, purposes was, as you can see from the following slide, to begin to connect the two different uh, connections of the university, that is to the north, the academic campus and to the south, the urban living lab with the fab lab. So to create a connection between um, practice and the academic research to the north um, in the middle, um, uh, which you see is the transformation of the parking lot into a green infrastructure, what we have called park and parking lot. Uh, number five, you see the transformation of the uh, garage into a mobility hub with um, on the roofs of all uh, buildings, green infrastructure with blue green uh, roofs. That means that we collect water um, with the roofs to, to reduce the impact of the local infrastructure. And at the same time, we integrate uh, uh, solar harvesting to harvest energy and have clean energy for the campus. So that you see that there is this idea of sharing between the different elements, both in terms of time and different facilities. Here you see very briefly some of our, our moods and some of the transformations that, um, that we have um, uh, on the agenda, the transformation of the roofs, um, the greenering of the building envelopes, and the transformation of the parking lot 
which becomes a, a very central aspect of the project. And the idea of experimenting um, with different um, biophilic and animal aided design features on the envelope of our buildings. On the top, you see that for us is very important in the tiles, this connection to the local culture, um, both in terms of natural and cultural um, infrastructure. Here you see it um, more along the transformation of materials and innovation with new interpretation of tile, which is a major part of the historical um, uh, culture of Puebla. Um, here you're seeing it as a tile screen. You're seeing it also in terms of parametric design as part of our solar pr protection. And you're seeing the recycled of existing tiles within our building. You're also seeing in terms of the facade, the use of uh, recyclable materials and creating places for the students to gather. And then finally, the greenery of the, of the campus through inspired in some places with water gardens inspired by traditional chinampas. Here you have a, a very quick view of the way this will be um, uh, in the future um, with the co-housing and the, and the plus or net zero energy building um, in the center. Here you see the image of uh, the rendering of the image as we see it as a very active place, a place of discussion and innovation. Um, uh, uh, here, um, the idea is that the building will be a very open building in which uh, will be constantly open to transformation through uh, local uh, students, professionals, um, and the populace as a general. Here you see the, the in the back, um, the open uh, water treatment uh, with uh, biological elements, the terrace for discussion among the students, and of course the green facade emphasizing um, evaporative cooling. Here you have the interior um, where uh, we have a material saving structural system, um, which allows large expanses um, along the idea of open building so that the building can be easily be transformed for different uses. The idea is that the students with local industry would develop projects that we would be able to test and scale projects in this facility for the local market. Here, um, we would like to maybe explain our idea in terms of um, our um, climate um, adaptability. What we've done is that we have used the CO geothermal protection of this uh, potential of the site uh, to cool and heat the building. We have uh, used a, um, a uh, what is called a thermal labyrinth to reduce uh, the the heating loads and um, and cooling loads um, throughout the year. And we have worked with a client to develop a program so that the um, impact from the user would be reduced. Um, on top of the roof, you see our thermal and solar panels to uh, uh, harvest clean energy. Um, here you see the night concept, the idea of activating the thermal mass of the building to provide uh, cooling um, during uh, the following day. Here you see the floor plans um, where you see the large open uh, spaces that can be used for different facilities. And you see the roof with uh, the solar pergola. Um, and here you see the construction site. As you can see, we had a very deep construction site um, which we use for the thermal labyrinth. And then on the bottom floor, we have an arena which is a part of the learning center. Here at this point, we would like to share a video. Um, thank you very much, muchas gracias, and we look forward to hearing from you. The Urban Living Lab is it's not just a building, it's an innovation landscape. New products, new practices will be developed to deal with the challenges that we're facing in the future. But it can also show how certain disciplines here at the University of Ibero are lived and are developed for the future. It'll be the first zero energy building in Latin America. And on the architectural level, we're looking at sustainable materials. I think the cooperation here at the Ibero is, for me, what I saw, very good. 
Es ist sehr spannend. Es ist aber nicht typisch in der ganzen Welt, dass so gearbeitet wird. So I think it's really the right place within the Jesuit network that makes it even more exciting because you immediately have an international project. Und sie können das, was sie entwickeln, das Future Design ihrer ihrer Arbeiten, das können sie im Urban Living Lab sehr gut zeigen in Ausstellung oder aber auch direkt integriert in das Gebäude. Well, thank you very much. Um Mr. Mola and Mr. Leonard, um, it's quite a decent project. And um, of course, we all hope, I think, that those kind of ideas would spread worldwide and that there would not only be three uh, urban living labs right now, but maybe 30 in the near future. Who knows? Um, I've, I've got one or two questions um, regarding your, your project. Um, Mr. Mola, you said that um, the, the rainwater is collected uh, in the building on the roof. Um, can you tell us more? Is it also used in the building? Like, is it used in the water processes for the toilet flushings, etc.? Or yes, it is. Uh, we have what is what we call a, a blue-green roof with integrated solar design, uh, solar panels, so that we use the roof um, um, uh, within the building uh, for the toilets. Um, We also um, take the surplus water and that is uh, um, um, used to water the plants on the, on the vertical uh, gardens, um, the green roof, which helps the um, uh, solar power work more efficiently. Um, we also have different types of toilets so that um, we have also in the building um, looking at which type of sanitary facilities would be more um, locally um, uh, suitable. So that is part of this urban living lab that we work with the researchers and industry um, to develop, scale new innovations, and then um, prepare them for um, introduction in, into the market and, and upscale them. So this specifically means that in this building you're trying out different ways of, of toilets? Yes, we try different ways of toilets, we try different practices, we try different materials, so that um, if you want, our, our building is in some ways uh, a monster. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a composite that is mm -hmm. it's always alive. It's, it's, it's not this traditional idea of a building mm -hmm. which is kind of, um, uh, it's a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. We're not thinking mm -hmm. about Uh, a, a building as a as a finished product, but mm -hmm. it's it's a, it's a living organism that is mm -hmm. uh, dedicated to helping make um, uh, the lives of the um, uh, students of the Ibero, but more importantly, mm -hmm. the general community better. It's mm -hmm. uh, the idea is is generating innovation, which also helps uh, generate local um, economic development, which is really mm -hmm. important. Um, uh, for this region. Yeah, especially for, for Latin America. Of course, I've also been to, to Mexico and I know there, there are, are millions of, of young people waiting for good education and also for good employment opportunities. So um, that's for sure. And, and well, as, as you have shown, um, well, I, I, I guess that students will write their master's or bachelor thesis on specific technologies which are used in the house or do probably some, some project works within their studies on, on different technologies. Is, is that how we can imagine the, the project? Or? Yes, we, it's not only it's the students, of course, um, uh, faculty, but also uh, students and researchers from other faculty. So mm -hmm. we're already cooperating, for instance, with uh, um, here in Berlin, with uh, uh, the, the Berlin uh, Hochschule for Technik, but we've cooperated mm -hmm. with Karlsruhe, we're cooperating with the ETSAM, so that mm -hmm. we've had a student from Karlsruhe which developed some of these concepts for um, uh, the sanitary facilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we are working with um, Swiss researchers, researchers which are dealing with evaporative cooling um, mm -hmm. uh, capabilities. Um, we are also working with local industry because Uh, for instance, um, uh, Talavera has a very rich tradition, and it's mm -hmm. um, um, it's uh, has a very difficult time uh, uh, competing um, with uh, large-scale ceramics. So, how do we find maybe the integration of 
of Talavera Ceramics within the building to provide um, um, uh, a local economic uh, cir Christ circle mm -hmm. um, that um, helps the local community. Mm -hmm. All right, great. And and what also came to my mind is when when you showed the whole, well, the 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 car park well it is actually really a car park not only parking spot but a park green park the whole building is green and what came to my mind is um i probably think that all of us know the the idea or this concept of of urban heat islands that that the cities in summer are heating up tremendously and um, of course green facades will cool down your building so i mean it's kind of a joke but i thought that yeah this is really a cool spot in the city then Yes, um, and, 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 and the idea of, uh, thank you very much, because this is one of the central mm -hmm. issues. We, we, on the one hand, that uh, we, uh, Puebla, through this impermeable so surfaces, requires more and more um, uh, water uh, infrastructure, which um, it's, it's, it's cost that could be more wisely used in other areas. So the idea of, of uh, having less impermeable areas, mm -hmm. having ecological, um, improvement of this uh, uh, part of the campus and then being, if you want, uh, 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 showing the potential for other areas. We have mm -hmm. adjacent huge parking lots from the shopping mall, from the hospital. The idea mm -hmm. of shared infrastructure, for instance, would be another possibility so that Ibero develops something uh, similar to their own Uber. Yeah, mm -hmm. to provide mm -hmm. safe transportation, to create shared transportation for students, um, um, mm -hmm. which reduces the requirement for parking on campus. Yeah, and of course, the not only the students but the whole uh, community will participate in this or in the in the advantages of those uh, systems. Um, maybe one one last question. Um, is uh, regarding the energy supply. I'm I'm not sure if I missed something. So you you've shown us the the PV plants. Um, is this the, the the complete energy supply of the building? Or? Uh, yes, we have uh, we have solar panels on the roof of the Eden, mm -hmm. on the roof of the parking, and we have mm -hmm. also um, uh, solar pergolas, mm -hmm. so that um, through this um, we are able to generate more energy than we actually need for the building. Mm -hmm. We must say that the it, it, we work very closely with the user in terms mm -hmm. of developing a program that um, try to save energy so that um, we, uh, we scheduled activities, um, for instance, in the summer, the, in, in April, um, mm -hmm. uh, where we have large gatherings in the morning or in the evening. So we require less heating loads. Oh, okay, yeah. So a real, Sorry, a real holistic, sustainable approach, actually, yeah. Yes, and the Beto was um, very instrumental. And a lot of these ideas came from, in, in some places, from other places. So it's this, mm -hmm. this international dialogue was very important in generating these innovations. So that's one of the core ideas that we have in this initiative. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and I would say we are also part of this international dialogue to, to spread those ideas, these concepts and knowledges all around the world, or in our case now, especially for other countries in Latin America to yeah to really see what's going on and what's possible and well actually hopefully how all of our future will look like soon. Thank you very much and we look forward mm -hmm. to having as many um, uh, um, uh, partners on board as mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah we would love to we love South America so um, uh, uh, we look forward to hearing from um, possible partners mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and engaging in future cooperations. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as, as I've written before, I've already posted um, the, the, um, the flyer from, um, from Mr. Mola and Mr. Uh, Leonard. Um, about the urban living lab, um, your your contact data is over there uh, in the in the flyer as well. But of course, we will also share your presentation and and your contact data to our participants afterwards again. So thank you very much again, Mr. Mola, and of course, thank you, Mr. Lönert, um, who is now outside the camera. But he's, thank he's, you very he's, much. He's going to rejoin us. Here he is. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, you both, for your presentation, and well, I wish you the best. As I said, for for many, many more projects to come. Thank you.
you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity. All the best. Thanks. Hasta luego. <laughs> Hasta luego. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, and now um, I also want, of course, we always want to, to see uh, and hear and listen to the other side, not only to, to German experts and companies, but also as well to people from Latin America sharing their point of views and, and their, their projects and ideas. And I, here you can see him already. I would like to welcome very much and heartily Andreas Alcala from the Uh, CAF, the Banco de Desarrollo de Latin America, so the uh, Latin American Development Bank in English. Yeah. Hello, Andros, welcome. Hello, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> I'm going to share my, my screen right now. Yeah, please, please go ahead. So, um, so Andres is the principal executive for um, the principal executive specialist in urban mobility. At the uh, at CAF, and um, he will give us an insight about e-mobility in the public transport sector in Latin America. And um, as I guess that most of you have already been to to Latin America, and you all know that that buses is the way of commuting to work for 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 regular people. They don't have so many train systems installed as, as we here in, in Europe. Not everybody owns one or two or three cars like we here in Europe or in the US. So it's really a different perspective and, and I'm really thrilled to, to, to listen to your experiences, Andros, please. Thank you, Ferdinand. Um, again, thank you for the invitation. I, I think I'm, I'm gonna make the presentation in Spanish uh, due to the, uh, the time that is given. And, uh, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, muchas gracias a todos por, por la invitación. Un poco quería eh, iniciar con, eh, para los que no conocen CAF, eh, somos el Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina, que tiene como eh, misión y como visión trabajar en el desarrollo de la región, en la integración y la sostenibilidad eh, de la región, tanto en el sector público, que es su, su, su principal eh, eh, trabajo como en el sector privado también para apoyar todos estos proyectos que conduzcan al desarrollo de nuestra región en, en Latinoamérica. Ya entrando en, en los temas de, de movilidad eléctrica, que es el, el, el tópico de la, de la presentación hoy, eh, yo quisiera de dejar y, y quedaría muy contento si, si dejara este mensaje en que la movilidad eléctrica y el por qué entramos en la movilidad eléctrica, pero sobre todo porque eh, para nosotros es mucho más allá que un cambio de un vehículo o, o, o la introducción de una nueva tecnología, eh, sobre todo en el sector transporte. Eh, la, la movilidad eléctrica tiene un ecosistema eh, complejo que tiene muchos actores eh, que, que hacen parte de... de del, del, del sector transporte, en donde tienen mucho que ver los aspectos normativos, eh, la infraestructura como no, la parte institucional, la arquitectura institucional, el sector financiero eh, y, y toda la parte técnica eh, para que realmente sea exitosa este, esta transición a la movilidad eléctrica. Tiene un potencial muy importante de generar desarrollo económico porque como pueden ver hay, hay, hay todo un, un ecosistema que lo rodea y que lo soporta. Eh, en ese sentido, okay. eh, nosotros tenemos la visión de que, la, de que este, este cambio de tecnología, este cambio de, de, de hacer más sostenible la movilidad, en, en este marco de la movilidad sostenible, eh, puede generar un cambio de paradigma en el transporte público, y así es como queremos enfocarlo. La movilidad eléctrica, y, y traigo aquí esta, esta cita del de, 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 de más reciente documento de Sun for All, de, 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 del 2021, en donde habla que la movilidad eléctrica es un componente esencial para la transformación mucho más amplia del sector transporte y que debe funcionar como un, con electricidad renovable, de bajo contenido de carbono y no debe producirse emisiones de escape en el punto de uso. Esto, esto lo que implica es que hay una serie de elementos y un, y un ecosistema, lo quisiéramos llamar de esa forma, asociado a, a los vehículos eléctricos ya sean de transporte público o, o personales o de la micromovilidad, que genera una gran oportunidad de transformación del sector y sobre todo del sector en el transporte público, de cómo funciona en, en nuestra región, en Latinoamérica. Um, es, esto es un tema que se viene trabajando desde hace ya varios años. Eh, no somos, eh, sin duda, no somos los únicos que venimos 
eh, que estamos interesados en este tema, que venimos trabajando en ello, hay, hay, toda, hay una gran cantidad de, de agencias multilaterales, de bancos, eh, de, 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 de fondos verdes y, y, y de ONGs que están interesadas, que vienen trabajando, que vienen desarrollando mucho conocimiento para dar el gran salto y para eh, dar el, el mejor hacer esa transición de la mejor forma posible en nuestra región y en el mundo. ¿Cuáles son las motivaciones comunes y por qué trabajamos en este, en este tema? ¿Por qué, es, ¿Por qué es importante? Sin duda, eh, los compromisos de reducción de emisiones eh, en los países de la región, que ahora se han validado recientemente con la COP26 en Glasgow, y, y, y que vemos renovada, renovado ese interés eh, en, en, en hacer más sostenible el transporte, hay sin duda también una preocupación por la contaminación ambiental en ciudades, eh, es decir, la contaminación local, el aire, eh, el aire que los ciudadanos eh, respiramos en, en, en nuestras, en, en nuestras eh, eh, ciudades y, y, y sitios donde, donde vivimos. Eh, igual también mejorar estos sistemas de transporte, como lo mencionaba Ferdinand al inicio, eh, el, los sistemas de transporte de nuestra región eh, son muy heterogéneos, pero también eh, si bien encontramos... Eh, avances en, en, el, en, en la operación de estos sistemas, hay, hay muchos que todavía tienen eh, rezagos y unas brechas in, importantes en la calidad del servicio. Eh, hay una demanda creciente por parte eh, de los clientes actuales y potenciales en la región para, para la movilidad eléctrica. Todos nos estamos empezando a preocupar, afortunadamente, por los temas ambientales y por hacer más sostenible el transporte. Y todos me refiero a los diferentes actores que, que, que hacen parte de, de, de este sistema de transporte público, el sector público, los decisores de política pública, eh, los financiadores, como, como podemos ser nosotros, no solamente de bancas de desarrollo, sino comerciales, y, y los operadores de, 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 de transporte también están empezando a, 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 a tener la, la necesidad de, de convertirse y de, de transformarse. Eh, sin embargo, este el, 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 no es un camino fácil, es, es un sistema complejo y, y lo que hemos identificado y muchos de los estudios que, que, que se han realizado en la región han identificado una serie de barreras y de, y de desafíos y retos que hay que superar para, para hacer realmente realidad esta, este cambio y esta transformación. Empezando por algunos que ustedes pueden ver aquí en la pantalla como la falta de conocimiento, hay, hay todavía limitaciones técnicas, hay necesidad de difundir este conocimiento a todos los técnicos de, diferentes, de los diferentes componentes que, que tiene la, 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 la e-mobility o la movilidad eléctrica en su desarrollo. Eh, también desde el punto de vista de, de, los, eh, de los procesos de licitación o de compra de estos vehículos o licitación de los sistemas, hace falta un poco más de, eh, de desarrollo para que eh, sean atractivos estos, eh, estos, eh, estos, estos llamados a, a, a convertir las flotas y a, y a tener sistemas de transporte público sostenible. Eh, el financiamiento, estamos también teniendo dificultades y estamos teniendo, y es un reto importante para, para ser escalable, pasar más allá de, de, de otra de las barreras que ustedes ven aquí, de la, de la fase de pilotos, y poder hacer y, te, y proveer un financiamiento adecuado a las necesidades y al contexto de, de, de la movilidad eléctrica, y indudablemente también eh, limitaciones institucionales en donde eh, hay que preparar eh, a, las, a las administraciones para poder recibir esta nueva tecnología. Desde el punto de vista normativo, desde el punto de vista legal, a veces no es fácil poder en este momento importar en algunos países eh, unidades eléctricas, eh, la configuración, la aprobación de, 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 las, de, la, de, las, de los vehículos, no es, no es un tema fácil y que tiene que transformarse. Eh, como les decía, esto, esto es un tema que venimos trabajando desde hace ya un tiempo, eh, desde CAF específicamente, eh, nosotros desde el año 2016 veníamos eh, eh, como el primer, eh, el primer apoyo que, que dimos eh, fue en, en Santiago de Chile para la zona verde de transporte de Santiago, como pueden ver aquí algunas imágenes de, de, del proyecto que, que acompañamos para, para, eh, para, para, para Santiago en, en el desarrollo de, de estos primeros pasos de lo que sería para ellos una zona verde, una zona de, de exclusión en donde solo operaran 
taxis eléctricos, buses eléctricos y, y transporte sostenible en general. Eh, después de ello, en el año 2018-2019, también desarrollamos este reporte eh, que ustedes pueden descargar de la página de CAF también, si, si les interesa tener un, un, una mayor profundidad en lo, en lo que de, se dice, muy enfocado en, en, en el transporte público y en las posibilidades y en el estado de situación en ese momento del de, eh, desarrollo de la política de, de movilidad eléctrica eh, en el transporte público en, 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 en la región, con especial énfasis en cuatro ciudades que trabajamos, una de ellas fue Quito, la otra Bogotá, eh, Montevideo y, y, y el mismo Santiago de, de, de Chile. Eh, finalmente, el, 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 el reporte más reciente que tenemos es el resultado, como pueden ver ustedes aquí, de un piloto de buses eléctricos que acompañamos eh, a, a la ciudad de Buenos Aires eh, en, durante cerca de un año, en, ya en, en el terreno, en, en, en acompañar eh, y entender bien los costes, la inversión, los indicadores, el, el desempeño de los vehículos en condiciones reales de, de operación y, y aquí en este, en este documento que también lo pueden descargar de la biblioteca de, de CAF, que se llama Cioteca, y ven abajo el, el link, eh, es bien interesante porque, porque nos da más luces sobre, sobre estos indicadores en, en, en condiciones reales de operación, como les mencionaba. Eh, y también nos da muchas ideas y nos dio muchas ideas de, de entender y de cómo eh, trabajar en los modelos de negocio para poder hacer estas implementaciones más allá del nivel de, de, de pilotos, ¿no? Eh, y, y uno de los, de, los, de los temas que venimos trabajando desde hace ya también un par de años con otras agencias, eh, colegas, eh, como mencionó esta mañana o, eh, al inicio de, 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 la, de la primera sesión, el colega de KFW, trabajamos con ellos también muy, muy de la mano, en este caso nos hemos unido también con la Agencia Francesa de Desarrollo, por Parco GIZ también de, eh, eh, que ustedes conocerán muy bien para eh, tratar de estructurar un programa que permita esto que estamos, que estamos mencionando tratar de escalar el desarrollo de la movilidad eléctrica en la región, no solamente desde el punto de vista de la preparación de los negocios, de los estudios, de las necesidades de adaptaciones normativas, sino también de apoyar ese escalamiento desde el punto de vista de financiamiento, con financiamiento concesional. Y estamos trabajando y venimos trabajando, hemos hecho estudios para eh, acceder a fondos concesionales de una, una de las agencias de los fondos verdes, de, 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 concretamente del GCF, del Fondo Verde para el Clima, en donde estamos todavía en procesos de, de negociación para poder llegar a 11 países de la región con este, eh, eh, con este programa que queremos desarrollar. En el, en el marco de este programa hemos encontrado muchas, muchos aspectos interesantísimos de, de, de cómo se describe y cuál es la situación del sector transporte. Aquí pueden ustedes ver algunos de ellos, pero la gran conclusión es que eh, hay una necesidad, al menos en el contexto actual y de forma temporal, de incorporar incentivos y esquemas diferentes de financiamiento y que hay un alto interés e impulso del sector, eh, tanto a nivel nacional como a nivel local, para hacer esto realidad. Eh, estamos con urgencias climáticas, con crisis climáticas, y esto eh, ofrece un escenario eh, muy propicio para poder eh, apoyar a los países y a las ciudades concretamente en esta transformación, como les decía. Eh, hay muchos problemas y, y de, de mucho tipo, no solamente el tema financiero, eh, pero eh, insisto en que esto, eh, eh, esta transición ofrece la oportunidad de, eh, de avanzar y de, de hacer un cambio radical en la forma en cómo se ofrece el transporte público, el servicio de transporte público en la región. Esto solo quería traerlos, traer la manera de ejemplo de, de parte de los estudios que hicimos dentro de, dentro de esta iniciativa, de la estructuración de esta iniciativa, en donde veíamos las comparaciones de los eh, TCO, del, del Total Cost of Ownership, de los buses eléctricos, por ejemplo, en, en, en Paraguay, y, y cómo si lo comparábamos con buses eh, de, de, de combustión interna, eh, este, este resultado de, de, de dólares por kilómetro es claramente beneficioso para eh, los, los buses eléctricos, tanto en el escenario actual como en el escenario futuro. En el futuro, mucho mejor, porque esperamos eh, que, que los costos de producción, que los costos de, de, los, de los buses eléctricos, especialmente de las baterías, eh, eh, ven, sigan, eh, sigan en descenso y que, y, que, y que realmente proporcionen una ventaja importante. Porque 
eh, el CAPEX y, y la inversión inicial es una de las barreras que, como ustedes pueden ver, es, es importante eh, de superar para, para esta transición. Otro de los elementos muy importantes y también traía como esto como ejemplo, eh, no es que estén implementados específicamente en el caso de Panamá, pero, pero sí son propuestas de, de cómo podrían funcionar estos nuevos modelos de negocio que permitirían realmente hacer viable esta, esta transformación a la movilidad eléctrica. Estos nuevos modelos de negocio tienen diferentes matices y se tienen que acomodar a las diferentes realidades de cada uno de los países, a la cultura empresarial y de los operadores de transporte de cada uno de los países, a la normativa y, y, y a una serie de, de elementos que, que conforman los ecosistemas en cada uno de los países, pero parten de un principio básico que se ha encontrado en, en ya en, en, en algunas ciudades que han, que han implementado este tipo de modelos, en donde por lo primero y, y lo más importante para aislar el riesgo de demanda es eh, separar la propiedad de los vehículos de la operación misma de, de, del transporte público. Al realizar esto es posible y con la participación muy activa del sector público, de los gobiernos, es, es muy posible y es, es factible y es bancable la operación. Es decir, hay, hay, una, hay una, una posibilidad de avanzar en este tipo de, de modelos y de transformar y de darle sostenibilidad en el tiempo también a la operación. El sector en la región viene, viene teniendo problemas eh, y, y una crisis importante en, en reducción de la demanda, en reducción de la calidad del servicio y es algo que eh, vemos nosotros ahora una oportunidad de eh, darle esa sostenibilidad y mejoras al, al, al transporte público. Esto, esta diapositiva la quería traer porque es uno de los ejemplos que venimos también desarrollando y acompañando muy de cerca a la ciudad de Buenos Aires en, en, esa, en ese diseño de la estrategia para eh, electrificar su, blot, su flota a, a, en los próximos años. Eh, esta estrategia de renovación que venimos desarrollando en este momento, todavía estamos trabajando en ello, eh, pretende tener una visión de medio y largo plazo de cómo llegar a esa electrificación total de la flota, que es como el anhelo de, de, de muchas de las autoridades en nuestra región y en este caso eh, de Buenos Aires, para poderlo eh, cumplir de una forma eh, eficiente y realmente atendiendo las necesidades climáticas de, de, de nuestros países. Eh, este, este, esta consultoría, bueno, este apoyo de cooperación técnica que estamos realizando termina con una, eh, una estructuración del modelo de adquisición y financiación de, de la operación de buses en una primera fase que, que pretendemos sea a corto plazo eh, y, y que pretendemos se desarrolle eh, muy eh, próximamente en, en, en la ciudad. Eh, con muchas dificultades, con muchas complicaciones, pero creemos que eh, podemos aportar y apoyar para que esto eh, se haga realidad. Finalmente quería terminar muy relacionado con esta, con esta cooperación técnica que, que estamos realizando, es eh, para que tenga como una, un, un, una foto general de cómo vienen avanzando eh, esta transformación en la región. Y aquí a la, a la izquierda vemos cómo en Colombia tenemos, eh, ya estamos alcanzando tasas de 200, de transformación de 297 vehículos a año, en Medellín, eh, también en Colombia, 134, en San José de Costa Rica, tasas muy ambiciosas de 156, Santiago de Chile, 83, y otras no tan ambiciosas, pero también que son importantes para el tamaño de ciudad que, 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 que estamos considerando, como en Campinas, en Brasil, en Guayaquil, en Ecuador, muy interesante, y aquí en Montevideo, Uruguay, donde, donde yo tengo la, la, la fortuna de, de residir y de y de trabajar desde, desde aquí para toda la región. Eh, esto lo que, lo, lo que buscamos y lo que se busca en el caso de Buenos Aires es llegar a, al año 2050 a, a, a tener una visión de eh, todas las flotas de, de, de estas rutas que se han estudiado, que, que, se, que sean propulsadas por, por energía eléctrica y mejorar en, en, en todas eh, la, las externalidades negativas que los eh, motores a combustión producen en la región. Eh, yo creo que hasta aquí tendría eh, la presentación que, que quería traerles. Estoy abierto a, a las preguntas que, que puedan tener para con gusto comentar. Desde mí. Thank you very much, Andrés, for your presentation. So, 
Okay. <laughs> this was something that you should not have seen, <laughs> but no problem. Thank you very much again, Andres, for your uh, for your presentation. That was really a nice insight um, into how how fast the market is actually changing in these countries. Um, I've got one or two questions. Maybe we, let's just start with Santiago. You've shown us they start. Of course, everybody starts with some smaller steps. So they started with some quarters in the city where they introduced um, electromobility in the taxis and in the buses. Um, so who, who would be the, the project owner, uh, owner in this case? Would this be the city of Santiago? Would it be the local bus operator? Or is it, let's say, with, with government funding and the government is behind this? Sí, hey, de, de acuerdo. Yo creo que es interesante, Santiago fue de los, de los pioneros en, en, en esta transformación. Eh, hicieron varias pruebas, varias pruebas piloto. Ellos eh, finalmente lograron eh, un, un, un modelo, modelo de, de negocios muy interesante donde hay una participación público-privada eh, bien, bien importante. Desde el sector público... Eh, y, y digamos desde el gobierno central apoyaron la forma en que los contratos de concesión se tenían que diseñar para incentivar al operador privado a adquirir flotas eléctricas y a, y a, y a implementar el sistema o varias de las rutas con estos autobuses eléctricos. Eh, sin embargo, el, el problema del financiamiento siempre estaba ahí, el riesgo siempre estaba ahí. Y aquí hubo un actor muy importante que entró a, a, a destrabar, digamos, el, 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 el problema que fueron las distribuidoras de energía eléctrica de la ciudad. Eh, en, en, en dos casos, dos de las distribuidoras participaron activamente y directamente de la estructura de los modelos de negocio para permitir el financiamiento de esos, de esos primeros autobuses que, que, que llegaron. Luego, este modelo fue copiado y, y ha sido copiado en Bogotá con mucho éxito y Bogotá incluso ha, ahora ha, pas, ha sobrepasado el número de autobuses que, que, que ha comprado y que ha adquirido para, para su flota, pero, pero todos bajo ese mismo principio de separación de la propiedad del vehículo y de la operación de la flota con una, digamos, una, una participación muy importante del sector público eh, para dar las garantías a través de, de, del subsidio a la, a la brecha de inversión eh, que, que, que haga viable y bancable eh, los proyectos, ¿no? All right. Um, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, yeah, you've also answered the, my second question as well with that. Um, okay, let's take a look at Paraguay. You have shown us the very nice differences, the, the comparison in prices, um, total cost of ownership for, for um, combustible fueled buses and electric buses. And we could already see that today electric buses are already way cheaper. You, you have stated that this will change in the future. It means that electric buses will get even more cheaper due to economies of scale. And, and I would just uh, like to mention that um, just look at today's time. So fuel prices will, will probably rise even further in the next decades to come so that those projects will soon be the only ones which are economically viable anymore, I guess. Así es, así es. Totalmente de acuerdo. Porque... Además de eso, y, y algo del tema que no, no, no pude entrar muy, muy a fondo, es, eh, está relacionado con todo el, el, el ecosistema de, 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 de los buses. Actualmente, eh, los operadores tienen una larga tradición, los operadores de, de transporte público, de, de otros, otra serie de ingresos asociados a, a la reventa de los buses, a, a por ejemplo, el, el mercado de, de autopartes, y de provisión de insumos para los, auto, para los mismos autobuses, que, que generan cierta barrera por, 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 la, por no saber qué, qué va a pasar cuando llegue una nueva tecnología a desarrollarse. Pero, pero lo que entendemos es que esta tecnología, si bien es, es mucho más barata de, 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 de operar, uh -huh. eh, va, va a generar también muchas oportunidades de negocio en, en, en temas como la economía circular como la segunda vida de las, de las baterías, como eh, las mismas capacidades necesarias para atender motores eléctricos en, en este momento, eh, el desarrollo de la red de infraestructura de carga 
es, es, va a ser muy importante también. Entonces, yo creo que van a haber compensaciones y, y el precio, también por, por las economías de escala, como mencionabas, va a descender de, 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 los, de, de las baterías y de los, de los vehículos eléctricos. Y esta brecha que hoy en día vemos de, 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 de inversión, de diferencia de precios, se va, se va a cortar mucho más y, y eso va a hacer que, que también eh, eh, pues terminemos, eh, yo creo que todas las flotas, eh, adoptando esta, esta tecnología, este tipo de tecnología. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much. And and um, one last point was <clears throat> you you have showed us your your project in Buenos Aires um, with a, a three steps or three etapas. Um, actually, I've I've counted four. I've I've counted uh, analysis, uh, strategy, uh, prior prioritize or prioriz prioritization, and then the realization in the end. That's correct. That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Yes. yeah. And so, yeah, that's, but that's really a nice point because you have also shown us how the, how the transport systems in, in, in general are, are working like um, intercommodal. So it's not only buses, it's metros, it's, it's electric uh, taxis or, or uh, mini buses as well. And that, that's a very good point that you really have to, well, you have to do an analysis. What's the status quo? Then you have to build a strategy or a vision and then you really have to go, well, we only have, let's say, that much money right now, and we have to start at that some point. So let's probably start with the most uh, relevant points. And then let's let's see where we can enhance this electric transport system furthermore in the next years. Exactamente. Yo creo que eso es, es una parte muy importante, al menos de, este, de, este, de esta experiencia que, que estamos teniendo en Buenos Aires, y es poder identificar dentro del sistema actual de, de, de buses en Buenos Aires cuáles cuál de las líneas que nosotros queremos transformar son las más aptas en el contexto actual para hacer esa transformación más rápida, ya sea por el nivel de demanda, por las características físicas de, de la ruta, por, por la capacidad del operador, que también es muy importante, eh, y, y, y por las, uh, las, los tipos de conexiones que se tienen. Y hay una serie de, 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 de criterios que se utilizaron para hacer esta, esta selección, en donde se llegó junto con el gobierno de la ciudad a tener una, una primera selección de, de algunas rutas y en un número determinado de buses para, para, para dar ese inicio a esta implementación. Nuestra aspiración es que esto sirva como efecto de demostración de que se puede, de que, es, de que es importante, de que para allá vamos uh -huh. todos, para, que, para acelerar eh, estos tiempos que inicialmente se plantearon, ¿no? siendo, digamos, conservadores, pero que se pueda, se pudiera acelerar en, en, un, en un futuro eh, próximo de estos tiempos. Pero, pero sí, es un, es, un, es un elemento muy importante esta el desarrollo de esta estrategia. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you very much. And one one very last question. Um, we, you have been talking, and, and I guess we, we as well, you've been talking about the major cities in, in Latin America, Bogota, Medellin, Buenos Aires, uh, Santiago, with seven, eight, and even more million people living there. Um, have you got first projects or, or ideas for projects received already for, for cities, let's say, with 100 or 500,000 people living there as well. Yeah, sure, for sure, seguro. Eh, realmente eh, es importante eh, diferenciar y, y por eso hacía énfasis en los tipos de modelos de negocios. Eh, estos tipos de modelos de negocios que han sido exitosos en, en, en Santiago, en Bogotá, muchas veces no, no van a ser posibles de implementar de la misma forma en estas ciudades más pequeñas o ciudades intermedias. Pero hay un interés importante en muchas ciudades de Brasil, por ejemplo, en ciudades de, del interior de Chile también, y, y es, han estado avanzando en, con, con ciertas modificaciones, o con ligeras modificaciones a este modelo eh, que se desarrolló en Santiago para, para atender ciudades eh, como Valparaíso, Antofagasta eh, y algunas otras más de, de, del interior de Chile. Eh, en, 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 aquí en Montevideo también se, se vienen desarrollando temas eh, bien importantes y, y, y se, han, se han tenido avance, avances eh, interesantes en el, en el desarrollo, que es una ciudad, no es, es una capital, pero no es tan grande como, como las otras que, que mencionábamos. Eh, y, y, y en general hemos recibido Guayaquil, por ejemplo, una de las ciudades que mencionaba, eh, ya tiene algunos buses operando, una, una ciudad que es algo más, más pequeña que, que estas grandes metrópolis 
eh, en donde, eh, donde se han implementado estos modelos de negocio. Eh, pero esto demuestra que sí es posible, que sí es posible implementarlo y sí es posible escalar la transición en ciudades más pequeñas. En, en, en misma Argentina, sé que Mendoza tiene también algunos proyectos eh, y ya están operando buses eléctricos. Eh, en general, en, en varias ciudades, en varias ciudades de la región está está ya operando la, la movilidad eléctrica. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I don't know, Andres, it seems like your, your work won't get boring and you will have <laughs> plenty to do for the next years until you retire, probably. Huh? That's right. <laughs> There is a lot of, of things to do and I think that there is space for everyone and uh, for every multilateral agency that is uh, that is working in the region mm -hmm. to to help uh, uh, accelerate this transition uh, at this moment uh, it, mm -hmm. it is it is what it matters right now all right great so thank you again for your for your great presentation andres and um, well we wish you the best and as you said uh, as you said there will be plenty enough uh, room or space for for all interested parties, institutions, um, agencies um, from all over the world to, to help create a sustainable mobility and sustainable future in Latin America. So That's right. thank you very much and well, you. greetings to Montevideo. Thank you, bye-bye. <laughs> bye-bye. All right, ladies and gentlemen, and um, now, um, As, as I've uh, said before, um, we will come to our last presentation actually of our, um, of our virtual exhibition and, and conference program. But as you know, last but not least, so we always save the best for the, <laughs> for the, for the end. So I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Andreas Zumschlinge from the company Parkstrom. Hello, Andreas. Hello. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much. Um, my name is Andreas Zumschlinge. Um, I'm one of the managing directors of Parkstrom, a company, a German company, and among other things, I'm responsible for the international business relations. The topic of my presentation is charging infrastructure and its technical and commercial operation. Um, so the electrification of parking spaces should be easy, seems to be easy for many people. You just go out and uh, find the charging station in the street, you plug and you charge. But um, it seems to be easy, but for people that uh, have to be, uh, to care about it, they will uh, very fast see that it's quite complicated, might be quite complicated. So um, normally a company that wants to electrify um, its parking space, it, it needs a specialized companies that has enough experience and that really can help them because uh, there are a lot of challenges. Well, let's, oh, it doesn't oh, next. I don't know why it's oh, yeah. And I think we are one of those, of those companies in, in Germany. Um, we are located in Berlin and our company was founded in 2012. Uh, so we have about nine years of experience. We come from the time where nobody believed in, in or few people believed in, in uh, electromobility. And uh, we do a complete solution from, from one hand for the companies and also um, uh, towns and so on, but especially companies, starting with an advice and project planning, we sell a charging hardware independent of manufacturer. We sell it, that means that we are not a manufacturer. We will come out with a charging station next year that we developed and will produce together with, three, uh, with two other companies. I will show you uh, later. And <clears throat> we do the installation. Uh, with uh, companies um, we cooperate with because if you if uh, we don't have the the people for the installation and um, that's not our business and if you want to uh, we are operating them but if you have a problem on site then you need somebody on site nearby and not have too too many costs to go there 
and uh, it's not worth to change a piece that costs 50 cent or, or, or one or two dollars if you if you do 500 kilometers yeah so then we do when it's installed we do the technical and commercial operation and um, therefore you need a backend i will explain uh, talk a little bit about the backends later um, we we are actually working with four different backends to be able to fulfill the requirements of our um, customers. And next year we will come out with our own backend where we put all the uh, experience and everything inside and we will only work with this uh, backend. It's, it, the aim is to have one of the best one, two, three, top one, two, three backends in the world. So why I am here in, in this on this fair I'm interested in Latin America. I was in 2008 in the first time on a, on a fair in Sao Paulo when you've hardly found something in the internet about electromobility in Brazil. And um, I had, I, I made a build up a, a small uh, network there and it, it grew and grew. And uh, one year ago with three Brazilian uh, people, um, we, I was coordinator and uh, co-initiator um, of the LEMOB, Laboratorio de Electromobilidade. We are only on Instagram and LinkedIn, but soon we will have our uh, website. And the plan of our company and my plan is to go to South America, to, to Latin America, in the uh, beginning of next year in Brazil first, and we will build up Parstrom do Brazil. And then we will um, offer our services also in Latin America. Maybe also in, in Colombia, I uh, spoke some minutes ago or one hour ago with somebody and uh, well, it will be very uh, interesting. So um, as I told you, I would like to give you a quick overview um, about important aspects an infrastructure and the operation, and I will start with the infrastructure. If you oh, wait, it's going too fast. Um, <clears throat> if you decide to electrify your parking spaces, it's very important to make a detailed usage analyze and operator concept. This is important for the selection also for the hardware. Um, there are various uh, it's it's um there are various access and billing options uh, maybe you have a company that uh, just has a fleet then you don't need intelligent normally don't need intelligent uh, loading uh, infrastructure if you want to share the the charging points and sell energy then you need an inter intelligence and a connection of the charging hardware to um, to a back end yeah then uh, also, sometimes if you have a big fleet and you have only a certain uh, quantity of energy, then you need um, either to, to make a new connection to the grid or you need a last management. Last management you normally have now in the intelligent, uh, also non-intelligent uh, charging stations. It's a local um, last management, but um, to avoid the, uh, the high prices um, for the electricity. If you take too much energy, sometimes it's recommended to have a dynamic um, last management also. That means that, you know, um, a charging station is a normal consumer of electricity. And then you will define, um, you know, the quantity of energy you have, you will define exactly um, uh, what, what consumer needs uh, to always to get energy. And, uh, and then you can decide what energy of the energy you still have goes, for example, into uh, the loading infrastructure. And um, yeah, the installation and service for the operation of charging infrastructure might also be interesting, um, but uh, it's not so so interesting for the for the selection. Okay, against. So here I, I have some examples uh, of. Um, charging infrastructure or uh, loading stations. I don't know if you can see all because uh, there's, uh, I can only see four. Maybe you, you see more. We, we can see five of the. Uh, you can stations. see five. Okay. There should be six. Um, 
uh, you see uh, on the Sorry, top, I can see, see six. I'm you see a big one, and here also one. It's uh, um, fast charging. It starts fast charging. You say here in Germany normally um, from from uh, twenty two uh, kilowatt, but uh, you also it's it's DC. Yeah, fast charging is DC. Uh, you can also buy chargers with 20 kilowatts DC, but normally it starts in, in Europe with 50 um, kilowatt. And this is um, for, yeah, really fast charging up to 350 kilowatts or more in the future. This is an interesting for fleets, uh, for mm -hmm. big, uh, for, for big uh, trucks and so on. Um, but also on um, for cars on highways and so on, where you don't have so much time to charge, it's very, uh, it's quite uh, expensive, and the installation is very expensive. You, here you see um, in the middle uh, up there. I don't know if you see my my mouse. Uh, there you have a small one. It's for home charging. Uh, normally you don't need an intelligence. It means a connection to a backend. So you just um, go home in your garage and, and uh, plug and, and then you charge. And then you see um, with one or two charging points, uh, examples of charging stations. Also, um, it depends on, on uh, the parking places. If you, if you need a charging station with one, uh, only one um, charging point or two charging points, it's also a question of the costs because uh, you have to, uh, Put the cables in, in in the earth and so on and sometimes it might be uh, better to take a charging station with two charging points so <clears throat> uh, then the question is as i already mentioned do you need an intelligence if you want to share the, ch the charging points because you uh, you have employees and clients and so on that that uh, uh, need to use or want to use it you sell energy and uh, therefore you uh, might must have a billing you must have monitoring etc then <clears throat> uh, you you have to take the more uh, expensive one yeah but then you can sell energy and also um, uh, get a return of invest in germany it's quite difficult because we have the highest energy prices in the world and you cannot um, uh, put very high uh, prices for the electricity in other countries, uh, especially in South America, also in France, where you have a lot of atomic energy and water energy, uh, you have better prices and you can, um, I think, uh, make good business um, with, the, with the selling of energy. Um, <clears throat> then uh, I can only recommend you to uh, Pay attention when you select uh, the charging station because of the quality. Uh, I would always take um, a proven well-known brand manufacturer. I listed some that uh, are well-known here in, in Europe. And um, yeah, I already said uh, this charging station, this stupid one, I would say it's about 400 euros, but the big uh, fast chargers, they can easily go up to 50, 60, 80,000 euro, plus an installation that might be even, um, even more expensive. Then um, not always the product that you find on the market is the right one for you. And um, here, for example, I hope you can see it. Uh, we had a, um, we, it's a client of us, they wanted to have um, uh, conception and construction of central char for the for central charging hub where they where you have find uh, the the uh, the charging station or th this um, the product on the ceiling so that the people the drivers just have to uh, pull down the um, the the plug yeah for the car it's uh, it's better for the for the place you don't have to to do this installation and this was something that was not on the market so. Um, uh, we were asked to, to find a solution and we did it. And uh, then we have, for example, a very big client. Um, and uh, it's, this company has a lot of, of cars and uh, also other fleet companies have the same problem. If they 
uh, if the, the drivers sometimes are not well paid. So maybe if you if you carry your your uh, cable um, in the van, it disappears. Uh, either it was stolen or maybe the driver um, took it and sold it. And on the winter, it's, they, they let it just drop on the floor. Sometimes another one dry, um, uh, goes uh, drives over and it gets destroyed and so on and so on. A lot of problems. So um, the challenge was to find a solution um, where you don't have these problems. And we uh, developed together with two other companies the product. I hope you can see it down there on the right side. So it's... Um, a ball box with an integrated cable. We will come out next year with this product. It's also because uh, there was the need of a new product. And if you if you don't find it on the market, just find a company that may uh, help you and just <laughs> develop a, a, a product that you need. So now, unfortunately, this uh, side here always goes away. It doesn't matter. I'm coming now to the operation of charging uh, stations. And therefore, I want to just to show you a little bit the main roles of the of the companies involved. You, it starts with the electricity supplier, producer, supplier. Then you have the charge point operator. This is normally the company that owns the charging uh, the charging station and uh, the parking place, and uh, the company that or person that, that buys the energy and delivers it to the um, e car driver. So it's called charge point operator, um, legally called like this, uh, but a company normally is not able to, to do the operation. You need a backend, you need uh, staff, people that, that are able to use the backend and this 24 seven sometimes, yeah. And uh, you need at least two or three persons to do this. And for a smaller company, also bigger companies, this is a challenge. And so um, normally the companies uh, look for, for specialized companies like our company also, and uh, they are doing the operation for them. And those companies like our companies are also called charge point operator. And what are they doing? The, the technical and the um, uh, commercial operation, it means um, they care about uh, uh, the, the charging station that it uh, functions and they also um, do the invoice. Yeah? Uh, the charge point operator, he sells the energy and um, we are doing the invoice. We, we are taking the money for them and we, we um, pay the money for the electricity to the charge point operator. And then you have uh, the EMP, it's a, the electromobility mobility provider. These companies are the companies that normally give access to the charging stations. Then the e-car driver has a contract with this e-mobility provider, EMP, and the e-mobility provider does also the, the invoicing, the billing, and uh, he takes the money from its client and giving it to the CPO, either the CPO like us, or directly to the charge point operator, the owner of the charging station. It's very simple now here, um, present, uh, the presentation here is very simple, but then you have a, at least an overview. And if you uh, ask to get the, um, the presentation to be able to follow this or to, to see this again, then you find here a short description of the two of the CPO and the EMP. Um, then I, I spoke about the technical operation and the commercial operation. Uh, technical operation starts with the commissioning of the loading infrastructure, then the authorization of charging. So <clears throat> there are a lot of things that you have to care about. Um, for example, the, the, the access which charging card um, can, can uh, be used for um, to get access to the to the uh, charging stations, maybe you have a charging station with a direct payment system, bank card or credit card. Those with credit cards are quite expensive, still quite expensive. And <clears throat> maybe uh, if it doesn't work, um, if there's something wrong, then you uh, you have the to to tell this charging station they have to give it the the 
electricity for free. This is interesting for supermarket and so on, because if something is not working, then you have a bad uh, feeling and uh, then you say, okay, this in this supermarket, it's uh, not, nothing is working. Yeah? So the, these are things also that have to be uh, taken, taken in consideration. Then you have the maintenance, interference, and the services, including any required equipment and change, also part of the technical operation, the monitoring of the loading infrastructure, and last but not least, um, the uh, support, first level and uh, first and second level uh, support for customers and also the last consumers. And then you have the commercial operation, as I already mentioned. So this is um, a legal compliant billing of the charging processes. And then the, the companies also want to have a reporting about this. And all this is done by the um, CPO charge point operator that has a backend. So um, <clears throat> I come to the backend now, or charge point management system also called. Uh, you will need it if you share the charging points. If you want to sell energy, as I already said, you need somebody or a company that is doing it for you. Or you, uh, you get a license and uh, do it on your own, but um, it's quite difficult, as I already mentioned. So um, it, it's important, the selection of the backend. There are so many backends in the world, but uh, you should uh, see if, if the backend really uh, does fulfill your requirements. Um, you should see that it's a state of art backend, uh, which uh, serves different operation models and your operation models. And uh, if you want to run this backend, uh, on your own, it should be uh, very simple for or, uh, simple for you to understand it and to operate it. And as I mentioned, we will come out um, next year with a backend. It's called Electra, and uh, well, it's a very special backend um, that will be highly uh, it's highly reliable and uh, also highly um, uh, you can put. A lot of, of um, it's highly scalable. Yeah, we have a, a central part in this in this software. It's only responsible for the for the work for the CPO and the uh, um, and the EMP and all uh, the other functions that you need for, uh, to operate uh, the charging infrastructure. Already starting with the UI, so the user interface. Uh, apps and so on. They are not included in this central part, but they are just put on, um, uh, uh, adapted with it, like extensions uh, with an uh, API. And so the, the center that really always must uh, must work, it's nearly untouched. Yeah? So this is a very secure solution. And we will um, also offer this product in South America. Uh, I think be uh, second uh, uh, from from April, May, June on, we will go also to South America. So um, last but not least, we should not forget why we're doing this. Uh, electromobility requires a high in investment, yeah, but we have to do it. We have to uh, do something for to reduce the uh, emission. And uh, <clears throat> the, the mobility sector causes about 20% of the CO2 emissions. And I th we believe that the electric cars are the best solution because of the efficiency of, um, uh, of the energy. You can see here, uh, an electric car is uh, five times as e efficient as a car with synthetic fuels and more than two times more than with gasoline, and it not, doesn't produce uh, all this, this um, it doesn't make the, the pollution. Yeah? And it's also more effective, much more effective than hydrogen. So that's from my side. Um, I hope uh, you could follow me. For some people, maybe it's very uh, simple. For, my, for some people, it might be too much, but it's always in, in the new fields. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zumschlinger. Yeah, as you said, it, it well, it seems so simple, but there's quite a lot behind that, which uh, 
which which um, secures how the system is working. So yeah, not not too easy, but um, I, I think that everybody, let's say, got got the point, got the idea. Um, I would like to to uh, also give you one or two questions regarding your your um, presentation. Um, let's just start uh, jump to the beginning. Um, when I let's say I, I have a small commercial, uh, I have a small company. Um, you 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 have showed us the the logistic centers. Well, this is one of the biggest companies in the world. But let's say I have a small company and I would install. Um, uh, um, electric charging stations there and I would have let's say PV on my rooftop so I would generate the electricity for my own. Um, would your company already offer let's say uh, an, an energy management system that that decides when when to charge the cars and when the electricity should go into my production processes or in my, my building processes where I need the energy? Yeah <clears throat> we we offer this together with companies that are specialized in this. Of course, that's mm -hmm. uh, for for bigger companies. But also, if you if you use PV uh, photovoltaic, it's it's very important to have this. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. we we are doing the full service. We can do everything, but we are not. Uh, uh, some parts we're taking from other companies sure. that are specialized in it. They said have more experience in this field. And yeah. we are using it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Well, just just like a lot of other uh, companies, uh, or especially uh, specifically from Germany, we are always, let's say, experts in our field, and and then we ha still have partners for for additional solutions, usually, right? Yeah. Um, another question about you 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 have shown us the the capaci uh, capacity capacity uh, capacity sorry um, of the AC and DC uh, charging stations and. Well, of course, it's it's between quite affordable and it gets pricey. Um, what about the cables? You 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 said, of course, you have to to uh, build cables in the ground. Um, would those be? Um, could, could I upgrade my my station in capacity in capacity, or would I also have to change the cables in the ground then? No. Um... The cables you define the cables in the beginning with the planning. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, the charging stations AC are going up to twenty two kilowatt, mm -hmm. so therefore you need a special cable. Okay. It's not too big, but if you have um, like if you build up like I don't know twenty or fifty uh, charging stations in one line, mm -hmm. then uh, you have to see if it's good to take a big cable normally. And then you have um, sub uh, uh, unterverteilung, sub um, substations to substations, to yeah, uh, uh, where you where yeah. you you come with a big cable, yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then uh, from this substation uh, there are come going out smaller cables because this is uh, otherwise you would uh, lose too much energy if you have a big cable you can give a lot of energy but if you have to to uh, to uh, have cables of 50 or 100 or 200 meters mm -hmm. and you go with a small cable uh, then it's uh, you lose too much energy mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. so there's okay. a, a also a lot of of challenges in, mm -hmm. in this field yeah but but um I, so to, to clarify that because you you were talking about let's say scaling up for for a whole parking lot not just for for one charging station but for for plenty of them and what i thought was let's say i would install me um or at my company a charging station with um with 50 kilowatt dc uh, capacity and then after five or ten years i would like to um, to have a fast uh, super charging station of 350 kilowatt um could i let's say uh, dimensionate the, the cable um, at the beginning or, or how would this work? Well, well, first you have to find the right uh, charging stations. Yeah, you can, uh, you have charging stations that have the capacity of, of 50 kilowatt or uh, 75, but you can grade it up. Mm -hmm. And then of course you have in the beginning already to see if there's the possibility that you will make an upgrade and then you have to to have uh, put the right cable from the beginning on mm -hmm. otherwise you have to take it out mm -hmm. and and put a new one and this is very expensive mm -hmm. okay but i but i could use let's say from the beginning i could use the the cable which is uh, for regularly it would be for 350 uh, kilowatt but i could still use the same cable today for for 50 kilowatt 
Yes, but you would not. Yeah, of course. Or, uh, or would it not be economically uh, viable? Uh, I would say in the beginning, uh, really do the right planning, mm -hmm. and then use the right cable. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah. you know that there. there um, I don't know how you, how you call it. It's in layer or pipes, empty okay. pipes, yeah. and it's you can pipe. take also out the the old cable and put mm -hmm. put in a new cable. But okay. the pipes have to to be uh, have yeah. have the right dim dimension. Yeah. Ah, okay, okay. So, so you you just dig once and and put the the pipeline or the cable inside it uh, in the yeah. ground, and then afterwards I could just change my take cable more or less the, easily. The bigger yeah. one inside. Yeah. 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 All right. Um, of course. Well, you've you've already um, described this whole. Of course, this is quite complex. The field of of um, which company and and your company as well is is active at which point of the value chain. So actually, I, I won't come back to this because you've really described it quite well. Um, you, you have already seen uh, also seen the the presentation from from Andres Alcala on on e mobility in in the public transport sector as well. And um, one question would be, is there a, a general difference between charging stations for, for buses and cars? Um, or, or could your stations already more or less already be used for, for electric buses as well? Um, also, as I mentioned, uh, we are not bounded on, on specific products. Mm -hmm. We will also go into the uh, installation of um, uh, Uh, for, of chargers, fast chargers for buses. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm well informed, there will be, they are working on, on solutions for one, for more than 1000 kilowatt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To charge very fast. Mm -hmm. But this is still the future. Um, <clears throat> we could do this also. Yeah. Also mm -hmm. with Antograph for, for the buses. Mm -hmm. uh, we maybe that we will maybe we will we will uh, do one project this year mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done it yet but we could do this because the technique is there and the the, the um, problems are nearly always the same mm -hmm. yeah. okay but um, just to clarify this again um, you, you've talked about a thousand kilowatt um, I think we, right now we are talking about let's say some kind of super fast charging station, which is actually at, at a bus stop where the bus is probably just staying for, for 30 seconds or for a minute or so. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, the bus comes sometimes for some minutes. It's, it's, it's uh, when it's, the, I, I'm, I, as I told you, mm -hmm. we are, at the moment we are not doing this. Yeah? Yeah. So I have, I'm not the expert in this, but okay. the buses go inside and they can charge. You mm -hmm. find uh, solutions uh, where you have either a pantograph that is mm -hmm. coming down. Like, like a crane coming from above yeah. and, and charging uh, yeah, with induction. Yeah, the, yeah. the bus has a mechanism and it goes up and mm -hmm. it goes into a line. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then while it's it's there, it's it's getting energy mm -hmm. and uh, the most energy it will get when it has to, when the bus has to stay mm -hmm. about uh, 20 minutes maybe. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe it's something is interesting. I last now two two years ago I was in a meeting and the the Berlin um, company for the buses, mm -hmm. public uh, buses, mm -hmm. they said they, that they um, reduced the costs with the, with the electri with, with, uh, by electrifying mm -hmm. uh, the, the bus fleet. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, uh, I was astonished because uh, you see, uh, the buses are quite expensive mm -hmm. and the installation also, but the, the running costs are going down and down and down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Energy yeah, and um, uh, the, from the, um, uh, was heißt, uh, die Wartung von the Auto, um, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the maintenance, from the maintenance the, of the yeah. car, yeah, uh, changing of oil, brakes, yeah. and so on. So this is, the, yeah. they, they, uh, it's not, it's, it doesn't uh, uh, cause the, these costs again. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I was also quite impressed. This this was in the in the presentation from from Andres before the the total cost of ownership that this is already cheaper for electric buses and of course this can be uh, transferred of course to to electric cars as well that they are of course already cheaper in the in the total um, life cycle process because let's say the maintenance costs are, are way lower there are way uh, fewer parts um, which which need maintenance and and this of course applies to you as well um and okay and and you've shown us the the prices which, which as which i said um 
it, it starts from from quite decent prices to really i mean you, you said up to eighty thousand euro for a charging station um this to be honest it's quite a much sounds for me uh, as not an expert um for for companies how how could they compare this to their already ongoing fossil fueled um, um system they would have to take a look at the again at the at the total cost of of ownership over the lifetime of their their fleet or their cars right well um if you followed the news uh, uh about tesla you know tesla is making most money uh by selling these um uh the co2 the certificates yeah yeah the, the co2 so, uh, uh, certificates they, because they, they are the company will reduce these costs yeah. first then um, if there are, they have to, to, to uh, get other solutions, um, mm -hmm. electric or, um, um, well, uh, Wasserstoff fuel mm -hmm. um, uh, solutions for the, mm -hmm. for the buses and, mm -hmm. and um, the, uh, yeah, the fleet. Mm -hmm. So um, if they do not do it, well, they will have higher costs and, um, it's an investment that's clear mm -hmm. but we have to do it yeah mm -hmm. and uh, i think five or six years ago i was in a meeting mm -hmm. and tesla came out and so on there were a lot of people rich people and i think most of them came with a bmw uh, for eighty thousand euros mm -hmm. or, or mercedes and they then they are and with a maybe with a watch for twenty thousand mm -hmm. euro and so on and then they 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 ask but uh why should I buy a Tesla? Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't bring me money. It doesn't give me money. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But they forgot that, that they have another car that mm -hmm. also took the main cost. And if you have a supermarket uh, um, if you, uh, and, or a company mm -hmm. and the people that, that are coming to you, uh, the employees and so, they have not the possibility to charge. Mm -hmm. yeah? They go to another company and they, 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 uh, the, the, the clients go to another company and buy the things there. Mm -hmm. And the employees also, they, go, they will also see what is the company. So it's an investment mm -hmm. to be able to do the normal uh, business. People mm -hmm. think that they have to get a return of invest in, uh, by selling energy, but mm -hmm. it's not uh, uh, the, the business of a supermarket mm -hmm. uh, to sell energy. It's to sell bananas and so foods and so mm. on. Yeah? And yeah. if they do not do this investment, they will yeah. not get the clients to do their yeah. own business. The same with hotels. So this is also a way uh, you, you should afford this problem a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah, uh, that's a really good point. As, as the world or our society, uh, society is getting more and more sustainable, you will only be successful if you are also success, uh, uh, sustainable in, in one way or the other. And of course, as you said, uh, hotels is probably the best example. If I would own a Tesla, I would probably just go to hotels which have some kind of charging station on place. Not only with the Tesla. Yeah, yeah, of course. With any, with Hyundai, with, any... with the Volkswagen, with yeah. uh, any other good company, which yeah. I, I don't want to face uh, these. No, no. Yeah, but I, I get your point. Yeah, quite, quite interesting. Okay. Um, well, okay, so that's, I think, I, yeah, um, I, I'm through with my questions, uh, Mr. Zuschinger, so thank you very much for your participation, and um, we, we would also like to, to share your, um, your slides and, and your contact data for our participants as well, if that's fine for you. Um, to you. And, and I've already um, shared the, the link to, to uh, Lemop. Brazil uh, at LinkedIn, at least here in our uh, chat to, to our participants. Yeah. That's All right. Fine. Thank you very so, much. Thank you very much and have a good time. Mm. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And this already brings me to our conclusions. Um, we have reached the end of our virtual trade fair and um, well, our, our virtual exhibition is still going on, at least today, you have the possibility to log in at our website. Um, we have uh, dropped the, can, uh, the registration, so just uh, go to our website and have a look at our participating companies, Parkstrom, Highwald, Biogas, Hochreiter, Flotwig, and all the others. And um, well, 
So now we have reached the end of Expo Virtual Green Tech, the conference program. I would like to thank again to all our experts and speakers from Germany, from Latin America, and from the Caribbean who, who brought here their, their um, knowledge and, and shared their concepts and ideas for a very sustainable and, and successful future, as I hope. And um, I hope we could give you some good ideas, some, some good um, perspectives on um, how we can really do the energy transition. And I think we can really do it. I mean, of course, I'm working in this sector, but I would say we have seen so much with, which is already economically viable. You don't always need subsidies to, to do something. Just, just go ahead and do it and others will follow you. And um, you will see that you will have success. And if not, we still have here a waste network, uh, not a waste, a, a very broad network of, of partners, institutions and companies in Germany and in Europe, which could help you realize your ideas and concepts for the future. So thanks again. Um, as I said, we will share all our presentations with everybody who has been logged in here in the last days. We will, um, we will grab your contact data and then um, send you all or the following information of our trade fair afterwards. So thanks again to, to all our partners and supporters and sponsors. And um, we will most likely see us uh, next year or at least the year afterwards. And one day, hopefully after a pandemic crisis. But um, so thank you very much again. And well, have a good time and stay green. Bye-bye. <laughs>